Great. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. And again, thank you for joining us. Good for morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Diaz. Um, we have a full agenda today, so I think we should go ahead and start. Yes. Welcome everyone to the Neonatal Neurocritical Care Symposium of 2021. We are quite happy and excited for this full agenda. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> and uh, we thank all the speakers and everyone attending. We hope to have a full session and lots and lots of questions and discussion. And I personally want to uh, thank Natalie Hunt for putting the schedule and everything together. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so um, like uh, Dr. Diaz said, we have a full schedule um, today. There were some changes in the schedule. So um, for this morning, we'll have uh, Dr. Groves, Dr. Carpenter, Dr. Yazbek, and Dr. Turin um, speaking. Um, and then we'll break for lunch from 12 to one um, for those that are interested in participating in pediatric grand rounds today. And then we'll start back up a little after one um, to finish through with Dr. Thompson, Dr. Ermir, Dr. Schofield, Dr. Hussey Gardner and Dr. Brescia um, presenting this afternoon. And then we'll end just with a quick wrap up and also just go over some of the, um, uh, for the certification for the neuro, um, neonatal neurointensive care certification. Um, we'll go over some of the information for that as well. Um, if everyone could just remember to keep their mics muted throughout the presentations. Um, at the end of each presentation, there will be um, a little time for some questions if anyone has questions. Um, also throughout the presentation, if you do have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll go back through those um, and ask those for the presenters. So um, we'll start our presentations off with uh, our presentation from Dr. Groves. Um, and Dr. Groves, if you'd just like to give uh, a little intro for yourself, uh, introduce yourself to the group, and then we'll get started. Sure. Can everyone see my slides? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Mari Groves. I'm the pediatric neurosurgeon here at Maryland. I'm supported by um, my group as well, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Jackson, all of whom have contributed in some way to the talk today. So um, thank you so much to Natalie and the organizers for, for putting this on and, and giving us an opportunity to talk. Um, and there certainly will be, I think, time for questions at the end as well, and um, some videos along the way. So forgive also some of the, the technical uh, limitations that I wasn't able to <laughs> definitely switch over. Um, so no conflict of interest from my standpoint, except to say that as a pediatric neurosurgeon, we do of course treat the full spectrum of diseases. And I take care of not only uh, infants um, and neonates, but also congenital uh, lesions that, that go into adulthood. And so tend to follow patients as well well into their third, fourth, fifth decades of life. And I think having that lifelong perspective sometimes can give um, a little bit of a different take um, to some of these early issues as well that, that you guys are seeing you know, very acutely. Um, of course, there are many reasons for IVH and we know that there are factors that are intrinsic to the developing brain as well as systemic factors that can contribute to an increased risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. And there's significant regional variation that's seen as well in preterm births, not only in the US, but even within our own state of Maryland and looking in Baltimore City. Um, so for example, you know, very preterm birth infants um, are estimated to be around 2.7% here in Baltimore City with about 200 babies per year being born at uh, earlier than 32 weeks. Um, so that regional variation is of course seen and um, you, know, you can make note that we fall somewhere between the Northeast and the Midwest. I'm not sure exactly where um, Maryland qualifies, but you know, traveling to other parts of the US, we can see you know, significant uh, regional variation as well. 
Now, there are risks, of course, with preterm IVH, um, mostly that are uncontrollable. Some of that includes things like gestational age and other uh, factors uh, with regards to pre, uh, preterm care. Um, but there are other things as well, including uh, racial biases that do um, come in. And we know that uh, black preterm infants are actually much higher risk of developing IVH compared to white babies that are born at a similar gestational age. Um, and these are factors that I think are really important to understand and note. Um, that we fully don't have um, uh, records for yet and completely understand the etiology behind that. So kind of to structure this talk, I wanted to talk um, from a hydrocephalus perspective on kind of getting us all on the same page with regards to terminology and talking a bit about the natural history and interventions that we can offer um, and why we sometimes make some of the decision making that, that we do. Um, and so I think it's important to start with the fact that, you know, fluid itself is not the enemy. And in fact, ventricular megaly, which is just excessive fluid, can sometimes be seen um, uniformly throughout. And it's hard to know whether or not ventricular megaly really is leading to pressure. And so when we talk to parents or talk to families about this, you know, there are certainly different metrics that we follow, including things like following um, radiographical imaging, whether that be head ultrasounds or MRI scans, the head circumference growth, which of course you guys are well familiar with, and we ask you to check. Um, pretty routinely, as well as clinical exams and findings, including things like following the fontanelle, for example, um, or other uh, markers like apnea or brady that might be resultant uh, for hydrocephalus. And so, for example, you know, here's a pretty preterm infant who developed uh, IVH as well as meningitis, and then following that, of course, had multiple systemic other issues that are associated with preterm birth. Um, but during the whole process really had, you know, and continued to have a soft fat now without suture slay and a relatively um, uh, it's consistent and steady growth of the head circumference. And so I think it's important to note in this case that even though there is an excessive amount of fluid, there really aren't other signs or symptoms of pressure. And in fact, the fluid probably has accumulated for multiple various reasons. In fact, we see transient ventricular megaly, and we know from retrospective studies as well, that infants who develop a grade three or four VH, um, you know, can have up to 60% of ventricular dilatation at some point during their neonatal admission. Only about 20% of those infants there will go on to require a temporary shunt, and only 16 will go on to require a permanent shunt. And so I think it's important to remember that ventricular negligence, even when seen, sometimes can resolve. And in fact, we can even see patients develop uh, you know, early hydrocephalus, for example, if they have transient issues with resorbing some of the CSF. And so, for example, here's an infant who developed uh, ventricular megaly following um, uh, IVH, who was noted to have a head circumference growth for a period of time that we were following, um, but really wasn't meeting clinical criteria and then ultimately stabilized. And so there's something within that process that allows babies to start that resorption again, um, which is important to note and important to kind of follow. Now, conversely, you can also have infants who will very quickly develop a full fontanelle or spade sutures who will have continued head circumference growth. And it's really hard to know, you know where infants are going to fall or what might preclude an infant from uh, following one pathway versus another. And so for infants, of course, that have all of those markers that are trending in a direction that you know, makes us unhappy, um, we recommend intervention. And in general, especially in this uh, weight range, it's going to be a temporary method. Um, and so it's important to understand, of course, that there are lots of changes that occur within the last trimester of pregnancy, and those can include things like cord plexus development and uh, development of the cilia within the ventricular system. We know that this is important because um, CSF is made within the cord plexus that has to circulate from the lateral ventricles, goes through the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle, and then circulates back to the arachnoid granulations where ultimately it's um, taken up to the venous system and resorbed by the body. Um, we all make CSF, and so a typical adult, for example, will make about 150 cc's, and so for those of us who um, aren't as familiar with that system, you know, it's about a Coke bottle of fluid a day, and so our bodies are constantly making the CSF, which is important not only for ridding the um, CNS system of, of toxic metabolic waste, but also to help protect the brain and the spinal cord and the nerve roots from hitting the hard skull um, or the hard bony encasement. Um, and so this question routinely comes up and there's not always a clear cut answer. And in fact, it can be quite controversial in terms of when to treat ventricular medley that's resulting from uh, severe IVH. And in general, I think there are two competing schools of thought from the standpoint that later, later treatment from a surgical standpoint is certainly better 
because we know that surgical treatments that occur earlier in life lead to more significant failures over the course of that baby's lifetime. But we also know that minimizing ventricular size earlier in life can also be better um, from metrics of early brain injury. And so how do we rationalize these two? You know, as a surgeon, I think um, you know, we're faced with shunt failures kind of on a routine, almost daily basis in, in at least our subspecialty. And we know that babies that have a shunt inserted in less than six months of age are much more likely to require revision, both from retrospective studies and then also prospective studies. Um, and we're part of the HCRN, which is the Hydrocephalus Network uh, Research Consortium, um, which is now roughly about 22 centers around the US that have really driven hydrocephalus research over the last uh, several decades started by a parent um, out in Utah and really kind of taken on by our society and pediatric neurosurgeons to try to drive high quality prospective studies to look at, at shunts and shunting and hydrocephalus and how we potentially can make the process better and safer. Um, and so important to remember that again, those babies that do have a shunt inserted at less than six months of age will have significant failure, much more, though, much more so than infants who have shunts uh, inserted later in life. We know this is not just a factor of the US and in fact, in retrospective studies looking in, in from Germany, we know that more preterm infants have a higher failure rate. Those of course with higher grades of IDH have a higher failure rate and whether or not they have a temporary system can also impact the longevity of the shunts in the long run. And so when looking at timing, having an early or a late threshold, early just meaning that, for example, if you see slight ventricular change, is that something that you would intervene on kind of right away or would you wait until maybe there are some more clinical signs or symptoms? Um, I think the exclusion criteria in the study are important to recognize in the sense that uh, neonatal infants had to be greater than 28 days of age. Um, we or excluding uh, patients also that had cystic uh, PPL and CNS infection, which is actually quite a high number of, of babies. Um, and so there was a significant exclusion criteria within the study, but even still they showed that a need for revision uh, of any shunt system that was placed was significantly higher in those patients that had an intervention earlier in life, as opposed to those that had a later threshold or a higher threshold for intervention. Um, and that was statistically significant. So when thinking of our own algorithm for intervention and the need for intervention, I think there are multiple different things that we look at and sometimes it can feel like we're dragging our feet a bit, which uh, invariably we are to some degree. And we always have to weigh, you know, um, brain parenchyma and uh, preservation of that versus a child that may not necessarily require intervention or stabilize over time. Um, but certainly once there are clinical signs or symptoms concerning for hydrocephalus, it's reasonable to consider um, uh, intervention, which is kind of where we'll go to next. Now, of course, there are no non-surgical interventions, right, to prevent um, or to treat hydrocephalus. Uh, it's important to, to recognize that actually my partner, Rody Robinson, is doing um, some really interesting work with erythropoietin and trying to reduce the incidence of hydrocephalus developing from IVH. Um, and I think that will really be the technology, right, to prevent hydrocephalus or to prevent IVH from even occurring. Um, and those are things that are on the horizon for the next upcoming decade. Um, but from a surgical standpoint, you know, there are certain temporary treatments that are uh, uh, available to us, and those can include things like a fontanel tap, for example, lumbar punctures, which historically were done. Um, but with a fontanel tap, you're going through the parenchyma, and uh, there's a risk of parenchymally uh, with each access. And so we really transitioned at, um, sometime within the last uh, decade or so to ventricular access devices, as well as the VSGS. The idea being, again, that CSF is made and produced and the babies aren't able to resorb that, so how do we resorb it? Well, one option, of course, is just to access the device um, and remove the CSF uh, in a serial fashion, and that can certainly be done through tapping. Um, the VSGS offers another closed system uh, opportunity as well, though. Uh, so placing a device and then creating a pocket or distal resorption pocket within the subgaleal space that hopefully will take care of the CSF that's being produced. Um, in essence, we know that these are temporary measures. They can last as little as maybe a few weeks to perhaps several months. And it's really hard to gauge and know um, who will fail when. And some of that probably has to do with um, CSF production uh, of the babies themselves. Um, and so we know overall though that the complication rates and conversion of permanent shunts are about the same in both uh, instances. And in fact, uh, this retrospective study as well as prospective studies really showed that there was no significant difference between VSGS and a ventricular access device um, with regards to uh, needing an additional permanent system in the future, which is roughly about two thirds to three quarters of the infants. Um, 
And from a complication standpoint, they're also roughly about the same, which is important to note that there wasn't really a significant difference in terms of CSF leak or infection, which also um, is something that we worry about with these devices as well. And so then moving to a permanent type of intervention that really becomes the VP shunt itself. Um, the VP shunt was developed by a parent whose child has hydrocephalus or had hydrocephalus back in the 1960s up at the University of Pennsylvania. And I think it's interesting to note that despite um, many decades since then, we really have not made any significant changes in the original design, which is a silicon tubing essentially that goes into the ventricular system, connects to some device which helps regulate flow or pressure, and then has to get shunted to an area of the body that can resorb that CSF or resorb that fluid. Um, so namely the peritoneum, although in some cases that's not a good distal target, um, versus the heart, versus lungs, versus gallbladder. Um, it can really go to a lot of different places and sequentially as you start going down, they really become less and less durable in the long term. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about shunt management because I think it really influences the way that we think about these patients and, and how to approach them. And I think too, you know, we don't see it so much from the neonatal standpoint, but these are some of the things that after the shunt goes in that we have to really consider. Um, and these are the downsides because we know that about 40% of shunts will fail within the first year to two years uh, after insertion. And so hitting parents with a number that high can be really, I think, overwhelming. And it's important to remember that the majority of infants over the course of their lifetime will have some sort of intervention that's necessary. Um, so when thinking about shunts, it's really important to think about why they had hydrocephalus or why they developed hydrocephalus. How we think of a kid with a myelomeningocele of hydrocephalus might be different than a premature infant that had IVH. We need to know exactly where the proximal and distal tubings are located. So whether or not this was a temporary system that the patient just outgrew the need for versus a permanent system. The valve type, which can be important when thinking about access to MRI scans or um, uh, you know, whether or not the setting has been changed. Um, and then making sure that we establish a baseline, which can be really hard within that first year of life. Patient history is really important. And of course you take a comprehensive history, but specifically with regards to the shunt, we need to know regarding the malfunction and revision history. So for example, kids, um, uh, neonatal infants that have a lot of issues, it's actually really important to understand the timeline of when that happened. Was this in the setting of the patient developing neck? Was this in the setting of a systemic infection that might've caused infection? Um, it's important to understand kind of when those time points were, and that's part of what you know, we try to outline in our history as well. Oftentimes symptoms that patients might have are gonna be recurrent symptoms they would, that they would have in the future. And so that's also something that we wanna keep close tabs on um, as well as any imaging findings. So not all patients uh, later in life will have imaging findings consistent with uh, malfunction. And that's really important to know as well. Parents are also often our best source of info. And so a lot of my job early on is to help educate families and to make sure that they understand the warning signs to look out for. Um, to have them kind of on the ground, and especially infants that have some degree of more cognitive um, uh, developmental delay, those children are really difficult to examine in piecemeal, right? Coming down and meeting them kind of in, in a single isolated setting. And so I think having parents who can really give you a more comprehensive history is, is really critical to that as well. So with shunt malfunctions, of course, the things that we're really thinking about, lethargy, irritability, headache, vomiting, it's not like a neonate is gonna tell you that they're uncomfortable, right? Um, we're more likely to follow Fontenelle, um, fullness, any changes in the slaying of the futures, uh, sutures, any like fluid accumulation that might occur. Seizure development is certainly something that these infants can be prone to, um, but should be considered uh, as part of a possible uh, shunt malfunction should they occur with non-set seizures. And so imaging is always recommended, especially um, for first-time seizure development. Um, it's important to remember that these patients that have short-term uh, access devices, like the DAD or the VSGS, if they were placed as infants and they're coming back now a year later or two years later with really no pocket and no intervention since initially inserted, we really don't consider that to be a working shunt, nor do we consider that to be a shunt malfunction per se. It's reasonable to get some imaging, but um, it's important to remember that those are not total shunt systems um, that we would have to worry about in the long run. Infections are also another reason that, you know, these infants come back. And I think neonatal infections are slightly different than those infections in older infants. Um, it's much more likely that you'll have transposition, for example, of infections within the belly that can then seed the shunt, or even transposition of um, bacteria along the skin edges as well. 
infants can uh, present with swelling. And most often these, um, these uh, some timing of symptoms are going to occur usually within the first month and you, almost always within the first six months of some sort of surgical manipulation. And really if an infant or any patient is presenting outside of that six month time period, the likelihood that it's a shunt infection is really quite low. Um, and so other systemic sources really should be more investigated. Um, a standard examination, of course, is important. And then we've talked about the swelling, incision, and then, of course, um, other markers of increased intracranial pressure, which can be things like uh, extraocular movements and difficulty with blood gaze, as well as assessing the fontanel and the sutures. Standard imaging, which I'm sure we'll come back to um, in other series throughout the course of the day, is, um, of course, important. And I think historically, we were getting a lot of CT scans on these kids, um, as well as head ultrasounds, of course. But when kids are presenting acutely, the knee jerk has always been for a CT scan, and that really may not be the best uh, source uh, of, of imaging for these patients. And in fact, we were finding that some of our really complex congenital uh, patients who have complex shunt systems, who are presenting to the ED quite frequently, were getting hundreds of CT scans throughout the course of their life. Those radiation doses and that radiation burden does accumulate over time, and there is a known risk for accumulation or development of um, of underlying oncologic processes just from the CT scans alone. And so really there's been a push nationwide over the last decade or so to try to improve and increase our availability to get um, ultra fast or, or fast MRI scans. These are roughly about the same time period or um, uh, capture period as a CT scan. And even with movement, it allows us to kind of globally assess the overall fluid status of, of infants and children with hydrocephalus. Um, and so really uh, the fast MRI scan has been our standard of care from that standpoint. Um, and infants as well, especially neonatal infants that present later in life who have a history of neck, oftentimes there can be abdominal or peritoneal issues with resorption that can lead to distal issues with the shunts that can require some manipulation and sometimes moving at the distal catheter itself. Um, and again, the role of the ultra faster limited MRI scan, you know, this is something that we've been able to implement here as well and we're incredibly grateful for. It's a fast T2 sequence that allows capture just kind of um, uh, sequentially as opposed to rotationally, meaning that even with movement of the infant, slight movement, we can still see the fluid filled spaces often well enough to tell us whether or not there's been significant change or global change or something big that we need to be concerned about. Um, and so in general, if there is a concern for shunt malfunction, if the patient is not acutely declining, it's really our standard of care in terms of uh, imaging findings uh, to work that patients. And so again, just to summarize, these are some of the things that we think about in the long run. So including things like history, imaging, other adjuncts in terms of uh, evidence of elevated pressure. And in general, we have a low threshold to observe these patients if we're concerned. Um, I just wanted to include some other helpful resources. And again, my job is really mostly of an educator for these families because they're the ones that are on the ground um, assessing these shunts in real time even after they leave the hospital. And so it's important for me to know that they are comfortable with the management and look up for this. And so I find that the Hydrocephalus Association, which has really great kind of patient um, uh, resources, uh, is a great opportunity. They also have um, local networks as well for families to connect, which I think has been very helpful for some of our patients. Um, now, with all of these issues that shunts have, there has been a major push towards trying to come up with something new. And I think actually it's really important to take a step back and to say that despite all of these issues that we have with shunts, again, there really hasn't been any dramatic change with how um, the procedure itself goes, right? And so as a result, we're still using technology from the 1960s because nothing that we've tried to reduce the rate of shunt malfunction has really worked. Um, and I think that's notable. We have now moved towards antibiotic coated um, uh, catheters. Uh, we have tried um, programmable shunts um, and all of these things have roughly about the same success rate in the long run. So what was really born from um, actually a global phenomenon uh, was the endoscopic throat ventriculostomy in the sense that if the issue is circulation of CSF, perhaps there's a method or a way that we could um, that we could recirculate that fluid in a better way. And Dr. Worf, who is a Boston trained pediatric neurosurgeon uh, went to Uganda and actually established a clinic there, was noting very early on that post-infectious hydrocephalus is a big concern in his patient population. And these infants and families were traveling 
um, hundreds of miles, often by foot, um, requiring a lot of transport between a tertiary care center and where they were located. And so he knew that shunts, again, with a high malfunction rate, uh, was really not something that he felt comfortable putting back out, but you know, not um, being able to treat kids with hydrocephalus was really unacceptable. And so the endoscopic rib ventriculostomy is a technique that allows us, which I have a video and I'll show in just a moment, um, to recirculate that fluid. And he found that he was able to do this very successfully. Now we have not been able to replicate some of those results over here um, in the US, which I think is an, important to note that the popularity of ETV CPC has really skyrocketed, mainly from, I think, frustration within uh, neurosurgeons as well as families with the failure rate of shunts and the willingness to try anything to try to avoid um, you know, placement of hardware as well. Um, if we look at the corrected age at the time of surgery, we know that kids that are less than one month of age do significantly worse uh, than kids who are shunted. Um, and that age really is a predictive factor in terms of whether or not uh, ETV will be successful. We also know that infants that have um, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus due to prematurity have significantly worse outcome, outcomes with regards to ETV as opposed to kids with other etiologies, um, which is also really important to note. Um, and so again, our hydrocep uh, hydrocephalus research consortium has really um, spearheaded a lot of the clinical trials that are ongoing. They're responsible for most of the prospective studies that we're doing. And currently they're looking at endoscopic fenestration versus BP shunt in a prospective randomized control way, which I think is really novel and interesting. Um, and if you will humor me for a second, um, I apologize, I wasn't able to, um, input this into my talk, but I'm hopeful that you'll be able to see this now. Can everyone see the screen and the video? Yes. Okay. Um, so I don't think that you can hear the, um, the audio, which is actually probably a good thing because it's my partner, Dr. Cohen, and he's known for his editing of videos and input a very, um, uh, interesting music choices. So he wanted uh, me to point out in this particular video that the pulsations of the floor of the third ventricle are in line with the music. And so I, I apologize to the group for not um, allowing you to hear that. Um, but this is a pretty standard view when we open. So the endoscope is placed in the right frontal region um, and accessing the right funnel horn typically. And then coming through, we're looking now at the frame in a Monroe um, and going through the um, lateral ventricle. Now we're looking through the foramen of Monroe and we see the septum pellucidum over here on the left. We're going through with the endoscope, through the foramen of Monroe and we're looking here at the mammillary bodies. This is the floor of the third ventricle that's pulsating. There are different ways to penetrate this. And again, the goal here is really just to um, uh, really just to recirculate the fluid. And so there are many different ways that we can go through it. But again, the idea is to penetrate. There can be significant membranes. And so the membrane of willicus is down here as well. Um, and that requires kind of penetration through both. Now, once the initial hole is made, we can use a liberty balloon to dilate that, which we like to do because otherwise the risk of stenosis and risk of feeling in this area is, uh, can be significant. Um, and so the balloon dilatation is, is used here. Now, it's kind of critical that we avoid any perforators or large vessels, and you're going to see in just a moment um, the basilar artery and the prepontine space. One of the reasons that we think ETB may not be as successful for infants who have um, significant uh, hemorrhagic uh, hydrocephalus is that this pre quantum space, which we're looking into now, can actually be significantly scarred over. And so that can inhibit resorption of some of the CSF despite completing and doing a successful ETB. And so here, advancing the endoscope, we're able to look into the pre quantum space. We can see the basilar artery. Um, and the pulsations again at the floor, which looks significantly improved compared to where we started. Now backing out, we're looking at our final anatomy. And so to the left, you're seeing um, the septum pellucidum. This has been demonstrated publicly from infant's pressure on this particular infant. You have the choroid plexus coming into the frame minimum row, anterior septal vein and the foramen striate veins as well. Um, looking at the MRI scan, these are special fiesta sequences or high resolution sequences. 
And I think what's really nice to note here is that before the floor of the third ventricle was bowed down, and now you can see the floor of the third ventricle here has been elevated and so there's nice positions and flow through that space. And so again, this is kind of our final completed product. All right. Um, so, you know, again, I think it is important to note that that babies less than six months of age do experience worse success of surgery, regardless of what surgical procedure we offer. Optimal timing can be really difficult to balance, right? And I'm not sure that there's a definitive answer one way or another. Um, we know that every time a revision is necessary, that those lead to downstream effects in terms of uh, hits to the nerve cognition as well. And so we do want to promote neurodevelopment, but also understand that if uh, surgical risks are higher, that that can lead to negative um, downstream circumstances. And so I think, you know, the overall goal still remains to reduce or eliminate the need for surgery, which again is, I think, what's being worked on uh, pretty rigorously um, in multiple, multiple places. And so again, you know, it's really just not a plumbing issue, right? There are kids that can be born that might develop into the way that do undergo shunting. And despite decompression, they still have really limited neurocognitive outcomes. And it's hard to know um, whether or not changing the ventricular size is really going to help uh, with that overall clinical outcome, even though there is data to support that, um, you know, that is something that can be ideal. All right. So that was kind of the first part of the talk, which was geared towards hydrocephalus. And I just wanted to use the last several minutes here to talk a little bit more about spina bifida. Um, and so spina bifida is a closure of the neural elements along the dorsal part of the spine. We've known about spina bifida really um, since the beginning and inception, but it was first described in the 1600s. Um, Aristotle and Hippocrates, though, had, had drawn myelomeningocele and had talked about myelomeningocele in a time period in which medical care was really non existent. And so infants were essentially just left to die, and Aristotle even recommended infanticide for these children with limited medical care. Um, now, when we think about spina bifida in general, from a neonatal standpoint, you tend to think of the open spina bifida defect crater or myeloma in the seal, where about 1,500 neonates are born in the U.S. yearly. Um, but spina bifida really can be uh, multifactorial and can be um, even closed in, in effects. And so those are probably the larger majority of infants that we see uh, with regards to spina bifida occulta. And again, you know, with a normal spine, you have normal uh, appearance of the spinal cord and their roots and the cauda kind of coming down. With a cult, it can be anything from just a bony dehiscence um, or issues with the posterior elements of the bone to herniation of the sac or herniation of even the neural elements. Um, but in general, this is a closed system and skin covered, and that really changes the urgency and the timing and the need for intervention. With an open lesion though, there can be open exposure from neural elements that can lead to CSF leak and infection. And so those infants, it's uh, critically important to try to close them in a timely fashion. Um, again, when we think about spina bifida occulta, it's a really large um, wastebasket term really for a lot of different things, all with very, very different kind of prognostication. And so again, a pure bony anomaly is something that is almost inconsequential clinically, should have no impact on patients to that of a split cord malformation or even a lipomyelomeningocele is pictured above here, um, which can have significant risks of long-term tethering and long-term consequence, uh, consequences and sequelae for patients. With the open spina bifida locations, we really see two forms. There's the myelomeningocele, which is more cystic in appearance and has a dorsally displaced pack code, to a myeloschisis uh, lesion, which can sometimes be a little bit more difficult and challenging to close simply because it's closed. And so our access to um, techniques to be able to close these lesions are a little bit more limited. Embryologically, these lesions uh, occur very, very early during development. Uh, oftentimes, poor women even know that they're pregnant. And so we know that depending on where the neural pole doesn't close uh, properly, it can lead to both anencephaly as well as more commonly the myelomeningocele that we see. Um, these can result from lots of different reasons, right? There are genetic risks that can be associated and other chromosomal anomalies that need to be worked up. Um, but there are, are also environmental factors. And we know this in large part because despite folic acid supplementation, which was shown to be um, significantly um, impactful in terms of the development of spina bifida, that despite these fortification programs in the early 1900s, although there was an initial decline in spina bifida um, formation, we really weren't able to get beyond a steady state. And so we know that there is something else that most likely is driving uh, the lesions as well. 
And so when talking to these counsel, uh, families and talking and trying to do some prenatal counseling, I think it's really important that we kind of lay everything on the table to provide the factual data that's there to allow families to make the best decision for themselves. Um, about 90% of these infants will survive overall with about 80% reaching near normal intelligence. And then motor activity, which is really critical for a lot of families, about 85% will walk with or without an assist device. Um, some might require AFOs, for example, or other supportive measures, but, um, but in general, um, especially with lower lesions, most of these infants will have some degree of independence. Hydrocephalus, which we just talked about, develops in about 80 to 90% of infants historically. I do think those rates are slightly lower if you look at more contemporary series, um, but also the significance of neurogenic bladder and bowel are really important. I think this was underemphasized for parents really early on. And as you can imagine, for kids that are entering school age, um, there can be nothing more embarrassing than having accidents or school or not being able to control bowel or bladder. And so a lot of our programs now are really centered towards aggressive management of this early on, even within uh, their neonatal stay sometimes, um, if necessary, in order to preserve bladder function in the long run and get them on a better cycle. Now, these are some of the other comorbidities that we have to consider, of course, um, including the central nervous system issues, which I'll talk about and touch on briefly, but the general urinary system, again, secondary effects often from neurogenic bladder, but can back up and affect the kidneys, as well as the GI system, especially if we don't have good bowel management um, early on, and lower limb motor dysfunction that really lends these patients towards needing a, com a comprehensive um, medical team to help take care of them. And so we'll talk a little bit about these three major neurosurgical issues, again, hydrocephalus, um, the incidence being as high as 90% in some series, and knowing that the majority of these infants are going to require immediate shunt placement at the time of delivery within the first early neonatal stage. We just talked about the fact that infants that have shunt place, shunts placed prior to six months of age have a higher rate of infection or malfunction, and that's certainly true for this population as well. Um, now, the significant proportion of infants will somehow, uh, will develop hydrocephalus and require shunting um, typically within the first month of life, but sometimes in a little bit more of a delayed fashion. And there is a higher incidence of hydrocephalus with higher uh, spina bifida lesions as well. We know that hydrocephalus does develop over time, and so it's thought to be due to a secondary effect in the sense that if there's a CSF leak that's occurring, that's perhaps pulling some of the neural elements down, but that can not only lead to the Curie malformation, which I'll talk about next, but then also lead to adhesions within the subarachnoid space that limit absorption of CSF fluid. Um, and that that occurs sequentially over the course of pregnancy as well. Now, Chiari malformations are seen in about 100% of infants with an open myelomeningocele, um, but are only symptomatic in about 10 to 15% that require necessitate decompression. And in fact, patients that present with issues with dysphagia, for example, um, or other concern for brainstem malfunction will often get a shunt first initially. Um, and that's why sometimes shunts are done in a little bit more of a delayed fashion if these symptoms tend to be progressive in terms of issues with feeding, for example, or different difficulty with apnea oh, or this. sleep apnea. How do you know that's what they've um, been thinking? So, perfect. Um, with regards to caudal herniation and brainstem dysfunction, it's very different than a QRE1 malformation. This is a second entity, and so if patients were to ask, for example, what's the difference between QRE1 versus QRE2, it's important to know that QRE2 is really in the setting of an open myelinic cell defect, and it's not something that patients will switch back and forth to. Tethered cord is another really long-term sequelae that these infants will deal with usually in about 30 to 50% of infants, although it can be higher, especially in some infants with an open myelinogocele. Oftentimes we'll read a diagnosis of tethered cord on their you know, imaging in the sense that the cord is low, but we know that, right? And so just because the spinal cord is low lying in nature or has arachnoiditis or tension there, not all of those patients will go on to develop tethered cord syndrome which really occurs, we think, because the spinal cord itself behaves like a tension um, in flexion and extension. We know that the nerves can be stretched and compressed over time, and that that compression can lead to hypoxia, which can lead to neuronal cell death and demyelination. Um, and so with that stretching and mild hypoxemia, we think that impairs neuronal firing and then eventually can become uh, permanent findings within the nervous system and nervous structure themselves. This can manifest with pain, motor deficits, or sphincter dysfunction, and often will occur during times of peak growth. Um, and so I just wanted to show a little video of a posterior repair, and I won't take up too much time here, but you can see this is a typical exposure for a, a neural plaque code, and this is a kid with myelosthesis in the sense that it's a fairly flat lesion. Here, we're identifying the border between the neural plaque code and the dysplastic tissue um, on the side. 
and trying to um, dissect that free. We're then gonna sequentially work our way around the neural pathway, uh, trying to make sure that that is separated from uh, the tissue around it. It's important that that's accomplished because if any epidermal tissue is left, that can lead to germans or other intraneural lesions that can occur later in life that would increase the risk of tethering in the future. Um, let's see, let's fast forward here a little bit. This gets a bit old and repetitive. So once the neural pathway is kind of more um, uh, completely dissected free, you can see the underlying fascia. And this is a dural fascial border that really um, is kind of a fused border all the way around. Um, at some point, we're going to start seeing the rest of the spinal cord as well on the opposite side. And only now when the spinal cord is kind of freely decompressed are we going to see that, um, you know, that the, the placket has kind of gone down into the, into the space. Here we are seeing this around the keel border. And so the freeing the keel border, you can see some of the nerve roots coming down here as well, going anteriorly. Um, and those are nerve roots that we assume is going to lose part of function. Anything that's coming up to the surface from a sensory standpoint is not, but you can see the excellent nerve roots there. And so the goal is to try to preserve that the best that we can. Now we imaginate and kind of fold over the small pocket because we want to try to limit and tethering um, posteriorly. And we know that that exposed neural tissue sometimes um, can stick, especially through the closure. And so the next uh, stage here is really just implication of the neural pocket itself. which is what we're doing here through this sequential um, time with these sutures. So now this really does look a little bit more like a normal spinal cord, um, believe it or not. Um, so in general, the spinal cord, when it first forms right in the neural tube, it's a flat pink cord and that has to pull down on itself in order to drive um, processes posteriorly. Um, and so, uh, you know, that can be important. Now you see the CSF welling and that's really important to note. This is something that, again, drives the risk of hydrocephalus. And in fact, we just can't tolerate um, uh, CSF leak for a lot of these symptoms. In general, the dural closure is not something that is easily identifiable outside of the spatial plane. And so again, here we are elevating with the fascia and the muscle and, um, and the sphused dura in order to kind of recreate that dural, uh, dural closure. Now, once that's sequentially done, we'll close that in a standard fashion to accomplish this, which you know is a relatively nice closure of a uh, dual fascia. We don't see any additional CSF. We can supplement this again with another patch, for example, if we feel like there's some you know, concern for leakage through this area, um, as well as, um, as fibrin glue, which you saw by here. Now, you can see how the skin is really stretched. So now this is. Um, fall from the auspices of our plastic surgeon. In general, we uh, do these procedures with our plastic surgery colleagues because I think they do a better job than I do of elevating uh, the knife teeny glass on the side and, and trying to get a multivariate closure. You know, that's the most successful way of potentially trying to um, reduce the risk of CSF leak. Sometimes we're more successful than not. Um, and in this case, you know, we felt like because we had a reasonable closure that we didn't have to elevate or turn over those muscle flaps. Um, and are able to pull this closed. Now it always worries me when we see a little bit of necrosis or ischemia on the skin, because I worry that those are areas that are going to break down, but those are things that we have to follow very closely and it's part of why sometimes we'll recommend or request that patients lay on their belly just to keep uh, pressure off of that. And that's kind of our final product there. Final product is unlike the final, the babies look like after closure. All right. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, um, finish with talking about kind of new um, interventions on the horizon in terms of, you know, potentially this need for, for intervention earlier. We know that both hydrocephalus and hyperinflammation occur during pregnancy and progress during that second and third trimester, and that there is definitely downstream effects that, that can be occurred. Um, there's a thought that some of this neurological damage acquired prenatally could potentially be um, reversible. Um, if intervened on during the prenatal period. And that's what really led to the MOMS trial, which is probably the best named um, uh, randomized trial, looking at prenatal versus postnatal um, care, taking, uh, taking place at CHOP, Vanderbilt, and UCSF. Um, but looking to say if we were able to do closure, which you just saw during the prenatal period, 
um, would we be able to potentially um, halt or prevent some of these downstream effects from occurring that would lead to hydrocephalus and TLA? Um, and in fact, they did find that, you know, that was published in 2010, and they were able to show that with open myelin in the hospital care that there was less hand brain formation, so rates went from 36% down to 4%, less shunt placement, so a reduction by almost half from 82% to 40%, and less neurological deficit uh, with improved walking at 40 months, although that was in a form of walking compared to post myelin care. Um, but there was significant maternal uh, morbidity, not only for the current pregnancy, but also for future pregnancies. Majority of these infants were also born preterm, uh, which can have impact on you know, many other secondary effects within that perinatal period. Um, and the maternal effects were not insignificant. And we're talking about uterine dehiscence, for example, because the incision that we have to make is in the most muscular part of the uterus. And so that is an area that we can't allow to labor in the future. Um, and there's a risk of dehiscence and even maternal death um, you know, for, for some women that undergo the process. Um, but there is a significant neonatal benefit uh, to some degree. And so understanding, and again, weighing the risk associated with this, I think are really important. And so the idea really came about, how can we make this potentially safer for mothers while still um, accomplishing the same goals from a closure standpoint? Um, and again, we know that there are dilemmas, right, that we have to face in the sense that there can be a neonatal benefit, but if it comes at such a high maternal cost, you know, what is exactly worth it? Um, and we know with fetoscopy that allows us to do the surgery with reports in a more minimally invasive way, that we were actually able to significantly improve pre-prom delivery, which is now closer to term, as well as allowing these women to do um, a more natural kind of birthing process. And that the fetal resorts were not compromised in the sense that there was still reversal of hind brain formation. We were, um, there was a minimal CSF rate that was seen early on, but not once um, the learning curve was kind of established and as well as to, uh, treated hydrocephalus uh, was comparable to all of the open health care results. And so fetoscopy is something that's definitely on the horizon, uh, still under uh, FDA investigation, um, but allows the same kind of closure in the pocket that you saw there. And so I just wanted to show a video of this as well, um, in the sense that you know the uterus is first exonerated, um, uh, very similar to an open approach. Um, instead of making a uterine um, uh, incision, however, uh, the port is placed under an ultrasound guidance, and the fetus can be seen here. We do give drugs um, in anesthesia to the fetus here as well, and we want to make sure, again, that you know, there is, of course, any risk, uh, a risk any time you're going into the uterus of uh, membrane separation, so that's really important. Now, very similar, right, to the person we saw, um, you know, we're able to uh, dissect the pot code, and of course, we didn't show you that in excruciating detail, but suffice it to say that once that's freed in a very similar fashion, you can see how it depresses and goes into the neuronal canal. You can see the nerve roots coming out down here. Now within the fetal closure, we're a little bit more limited. Right? We can't do the indication of the uh, neural plaque code. Um, uh, it's a little bit more challenging with endoscopic techniques and the tissue I think is also a lot more friable. I typically don't do those with open close as well. Um, but the most important part of any fetal closure is going to be obliteration of that CSF leak, which we think leads to those downstream effects. And so as a result, um, you know, we don't, aren't able to get that dual closure uh, as well as we, we would like. And so we know again that the myofascial flap allows us to recreate that dural space. And that's really what you're seeing here is that dural myofascial closure. And so we elevate these myofascial flaps um, and then plan to bring those over. We do use a little bit of a dural substitute to recreate a dural porter as well. And then we'll close the myofascial flaps over top. And so what you're seeing is working through two different ports. There's one working channel as well as one channel with the endoscope itself. The ports themselves are about five millimeters, so about the size of a pencil. And again, we think that that minimally invasive approach allows for um, less disruption of the uterus, which leads to better outcomes, maternal outcomes without compromise. Uh, without outcomes as well. And so what you can see now is this closure. We had to make a lateral releasing incision to get the skin placed over top, but we found that that doesn't impact, um, it doesn't impact the midline closure. And in fact, these infants have pretty reasonable um, appearance of the lesion itself. Um, and so at least in our early experience, now we have 20 cases that we've done. Um, you know, we have seen that there has been pre-op and post-op improvement, not only the hind brain formation, which you can see here on the left, 
which has now been improved, kind of um, suggesting that there's improvement or uh, blockade at least of that CSF leak. Um, and again, from it from here as well. With reasonable closure at the time of development. And so with that, I think I'm close to the end of my time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Dr. Gross, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And it's fascinating all the new procedures that you guys are doing. Um, if um, no one has a question, I wanted to ask you, I think as a neonatologist, one of the difficult part is in post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus is essentially when to determine the, uh, the optimal timing for intervention in terms of, uh, you know, as you said earlier today, delay surgery as much as possible. But we come to, for you, what is uh, symptomatic uh, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus? I mean, I think it's a really great question, right? And depending on who's publishing the literature, you're gonna get a lot of varying opinions. Um, I think from a surgical perspective, we always like to delay surgical interventions because we know that there can be issues. And, um, you know, We've all seen the cases where a patient gets infected early on, it can lead to serial procedures and um, really negative downstream effects, um, but also make it really challenging to get a working shine in patients sometimes. Um, but, you know, conversely, we understand that there is, you know, some potential for improvement of ventricular size, and we don't want to minimize that or lose that opportunity as well. There really isn't, you know, an established time period, and I think that's just something that we have to kind of make and decide on a time, you know, on a patient by patient basis. But certainly looking at things like head circumference trending can be really important, putting that in context of clinical changes. Um, and if we start to see changes, that's really kind of, you know, our, our time point to say, now we need to do something. Um, and then deciding at that point whether or not DD is appropriate for a temporary um, device or a more long standing device. Now we think that the uh, opt-in for the uh, BP shunt or the primary device will be uh, better than doing a ventricular shunt. And may I ask, uh, what size uh, do you look into for, for placement? Like what are the clinical signs that you say, this baby is ready for a BP shunt or a BA shunt in the, the model? Well, I mean, we have historically used two kilograms as our cutoff. There's a recent study from the HCRN that shows that 1.5 kilogram infants have no higher risk. But I think we also have to put that in context kind of clinically, right? So an infant who may, you know, for example, have a recent neck or who have other reasons why they could be having a hostile abdomen. You know, those are infants where if we can delay a permanent placement, we might have the peritoneum as an option for a distal landing zone, which, you know, especially if they have a lot of cardiac and pulmonary issues, um, a VA shunt is really less than ideal for, for most of our pre, preemie infants. Um, is, so there are lots of different things that go into our decision-making. It's not really a knee-jerk um, decision, but in general, right? Infants are two kilograms, we'll consider a permanent system, although we know that you know, there's a high likelihood of failure for that. Thank you again, Dr. Grove. That was a wonderful talk. We really appreciate it. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we can uh, shoot those over to Dr. Groves for answers. Um, so with that, we'll move on to our next presentation. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Carpenter that will be uh, talking to us about um, stroke and CVST. So Dr. Carpenter, if you just wanted to start with a quick intro, um, let us know about you and go ahead and get started. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jessica Carpenter. I have recently joined the University of Maryland Medical Center as a, um, another pediatric neurologist. Uh, some of you may know our department is growing um, and I am very excited to be here. So thank you Natalie so much for inviting me. Um, I am going to confess that I need just a little bit of instruction about sharing my screen. Can I just share or do I need to have permission? You can go ahead. Okay. I'm going to talk about uh, perinatal stroke and cerebral sinovenous thrombosis, uh, specifically in neonates. I have no disclosures. The objectives of my talk are to define perinatal stroke, 
explore risk factors and mechanisms of injury, review the diagnostic workup and treatment options, uh, as well as share outcomes and tools for prognostication. So when we talk about a pediatric stroke, um, there are actually a couple of different things that we're talking about. Um, they, under the broad category of pediatric stroke, uh, you can have an arterial ischemic infarct. Uh, and within that uh, broad category, um, we, we generally separate out neonates from um, children who are more than 28 days of age. Um, and that's because the mechanisms and outcomes tend to be fairly different. So if you're reading literature um, about childhood stroke, you really wanna um, make sure you've oriented yourself in one direction or the other, because usually the, the, um, the research is, um, is separate for those two groups. Uh, you can also have cerebral sinovenous thrombosis. Um, and this, is, uh, this entity requires probably some explanation. So a clot in the sinus or vein of the brain um, sometimes can be thought of as a, st a stroke, although technically a clot is just a clot. Um, the reason that it gets lumped in with stroke is that you, um, if you have enough obstruction of flow, you can end up with a venous infarction. So that's uh, kind of how we um, bring cerebral sinovenous neurosis into the category of pediatric stroke. And then of course you can have a hemorrhagic infarction, um, which in pediatrics, um, many people will just refer to as an ICH and not necessarily call it a stroke, but technically the literature does encompass all three of those entities. So what is an arterial ischemic stroke? So of course a stroke is when blood flow in an artery of the brain is impaired and thus deprives a specific part of the brain of oxygen delivery. And this can occur through two mechanisms. So either the artery itself um, can have an abnormality, um, which then results in uh, poor flow, or you can have a blockage of the artery from something like a clot or a fat, fat embolism. There's also another kind of ischemic infarction called a border zone infarction. And this is when um, you may have poor blood flow and the um, blood coming through the arteries as you get to smaller and smaller territories can't quite get to the endpoints. Um, and these uh, areas are designated in the diagram below here where um, if you think of the major vessels coming off the, the neck, so you have the, um, the internal carotid artery will separate out into the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. And if you I think at the endpoints of those two um, major vessels, um, you kind of meet up where that red strip is there on the diagram on the farthest, uh, at the bottom on the farthest on the left. And if you think of the circulation coming off the back of the head, off the basal artery, you have the posterior cerebral artery. And somewhere that posterior circular, uh, posterior cerebral artery will meet the middle cerebral artery or the anterior cerebral artery, the two coming from the anterior circulation. And um, under a low flow situation, you may have infarction where those two territories meet. Uh, and an example of that would be the blue areas that you see in um, the diagram on the right hand side. So, uh, you know, these areas are, are prone to ischemia because they're sort of the end point of where oxygen, uh, where the blood flow goes. Uh, you, despite um, blood flow being uh, suboptimal in a generalized way, you can actually have asymmetric or focal watershed infarcts. Uh, as demonstrated on the diagram again um, below. So very often we'll see bilateral injury, but uh, it is quite possible uh, and frequently does happen when we see focal or unilateral injury. So thinking about perinatal stroke and specifically of the arterial kind, um, we have further subdivided up neonatal arterial ischemic stroke into the children that present in the first uh, 30 days of life, uh, 28 days of life, and those that come to our attention later on. So the, the designations for those are neonatal arterial ischemic stroke. So those are kids that um, we know have strokes. We can usually, um, they have symptoms most consistent with uh, seizures. We go and get a picture and we can see there's an acute injury to the brain, similar to the MRI shown here on the right-hand side at the top. There's um, acute injury there and we can diagnose them with a neonatal arterial ischemic stroke. Uh, on the converse, there are some children that may have a large stroke around the time of birth but really don't have any symptoms to let us know that there's something wrong until they start developing motor skills. So uh, if you think of children, when they start using their hands functionally, right around four months is when children start reaching for toys and things. And it's around that time that somebody may notice that there's an early handedness um, where a child is using one, one hand more than the other. Um, and that prompts a neurologic evaluation. And uh, the common situation is that an MRI will be obtained and you'll see a picture similar to what's um, on the right-hand side in the lower picture where you have encephalomalacia in an area that is similar to what you would see if the child had presented in the neonatal period. 
So we call that a presumed perinatal arterial ischemic stroke. Um, and the thought is that these are probably um, the same entity, just the presentation is different. Um, so we have to presume um, for the child that comes in at four months that, they're, um, that they're, the mechanism is the same, but of course we have a gap um, in our understanding because we can't do any testing at the time. The prevalence um, is about five per 10,000 births um, with about two thirds of kids showing up in the neonatal period. Interestingly enough, um, the children that present with a seizure do seem to have somewhat of a male predominance. So about 68% of kids uh, diagnosed with a neonatal arterial ischemic stroke uh, are male. Although um, when you look at the kids that present later on with early handedness, it's about even uh, males and females. And despite these children having a fairly homogeneous uh, disorder, um, the underlying etiology for this, um, this disorder is, is unknown. It's, uh, it's very frustrating because um, a lot of effort has been put into trying to determine causes and ultimately with the hope of uh, coming up with mechanisms of prevention. Um, but to this day, we really just don't really fully understand why this happens. There are some commonalities. So about 85% of kids are born at term um, and about 70% of kids will have a uh, left-sided infarct. So if you look at the two pictures here, uh, these lovely little children that have had perinatal infarcts, uh, you can see that both of them have um, some weakness on the right side. So um, the girl in the um, costume is unable to fully elevate her arm um, uh, the way that she can on the left. And you can see the, the, the little guy on the left-hand side is um, holding his right arm in kind of a, um, a straightened position and his hand looks like it's flexed. Um, he also has um, his uh, knee hyperextended as he's trying to position himself. And as people have tried to study this um, phenomenon and understand um, more about it, uh, we have tried to capture what is the incidence and who, who, who's affected. And I've included this chart here of different stroke types um, to make a point about um, data capture as well as prevalence. So uh, this particular study um, made uh, a suggestion that the rate of perinatal infarct was increasing. And um, there's a little bit of a problem with the capture there. So in 2008, as many of you are aware, electronic medical records became more common. This is also around the time when the International Pediatric Stroke Study um, was getting off the ground and more and more centers were starting to collect data prospectively. So for this particular study here, um, before 2008, all their data was captured retrospectively and then thereafter was captured prospectively. So um, looking at the graph, it does seem like after 2008 that there were a lot more perinatal infarcts, but I think this really just makes the point that when we collect data prospectively and with intention that we do a much better job of capturing our patients. Just thinking about perinatal infarct in the context of childhood stroke, uh, pediatric stroke overall, uh, this graph here shows, you know, what is the, who are having pediatric strokes and uh, which groups are most at risk. And it turns out the neonatal period is the highest uh, risk time period to have a stroke as a child. About 30% of all ki kids with strokes um, have it during have their infarct during um, the parent during the neonatal period. So going back to um, research that's been done looking at underlying risk factors. So there, there's actually no shortage of effort in terms of uh, studies that have been trying to understand what is um, what are the underlying factors here. So uh, at least six of them are. Um, uh, well-designed case-controlled studies, looking at risk factors, um, and there's just a really a lot, there's a lot of range um, and inconsistencies within the conclusions there. Uh, the, the one thing that does seem to um, hold true is that nulliparity seems to be a significant risk factor. So moms having their first baby are at highest risk for having a baby with a neonatal infarct. Then there are um, some other things that, that show up um, not as commonly, like for example, this um, table here, table number three, that um, shows that having multiple risk factors, you know, for, for what they deem to be a complicated pregnancy or delivery um, may increase your risk. Um, I, I think um, some of the uh, challenge here is that there are the babies that are born that are seem to be otherwise healthy and they have these very um, uh, homogeneous, uh, perinatal, uh, very homogeneous infarcts where it's just the MCA territory and everything else seems to be normal except for their the fact that they've now developed seizures and have this infarct. 
And then we have babies that have complicated births and they tend to be a little bit less uniform in terms of what their strokes look like and also what their other risk factors are. So I think this may be an example where when we try and lump things together, sometimes we get mixed messaging about um, what the underlying risk factors are. Here are some examples um, of that point. So um, we know that children who have congenital heart disease are at risk for having arterial ischemic infarcts. Um, they, of course, um, are not children that are other eyes well um, and have uh, risk factors that uh, follow them outside of the neonatal period. So on the left-hand side here, uh, you can see at the, um, the top three images show a watershed infarct in a child with uh, congenital heart disease. And then the bottom two images show a um, small embolic infarct, again, in a child with cardiac disease. Uh, this is in contrast to the phenomenon that I just described to you, a perineal infarct in an otherwise well child where they have this much larger infarct um, in the MCA territory. The thought there is that this uh, embolus probably comes from a placental etiology. Um, and when we try and um, merge these two uh, phenomena under the umbrella of neonatal infarct, I think that's partly where we're getting some mixed, me mixed messaging here about underlying risk factors as well as outcomes. So to explore a little bit more, and I know mo many um, centers do not include congenital heart disease in their NICU. Uh, more and more congenital heart disease is managed in uh, cardiac units. Uh, so there, there's uh, less overlap of those populations, but it is important to be aware of um, children who have congenital heart disease, especially if they're not diagnosed at the time that they arrive to a NICU. So we know that children who have congenital heart disease, about 56% of them will have some kind of uh, brain injury uh, in the neonatal period of which, um, 39% actually happens before they ever go to surgery, and another 35% happens in the post-operative period. So I've included a table here from a study done in 2007. This is um, actually similar to several other studies that, that have been done, um, where they took children with congenital heart disease and performed MRIs before and after surgery. Um, these children had uh, no specific symptoms, and they found that there were, um, they frequently found brain injuries um, in these children, both before and after surgery. And you can see in the second column there that in the preoperative patients, about 13% had a stroke and 5% um, had new strokes in the postoperative period. Uh, there also uh, is a high incidence of white matter injury. And um, this is um, something that I'll sort of lump under the stroke talk, partly because uh, many of the strokes in the cardiac kids are small and it can become quite challenging to figure out when to call something a stroke versus when to call it white matter injury. It may seem a little counterintuitive, but the smaller strokes, um, especially in the watershed territory, um, can look very similar to white matter injury uh, that um, you'd think would have a different mechanism. And some of that um, may in fact be that the um, white matter injury that you see that is more chronic actually used to have a different appearance when it was a stroke and because of its small size and also the evolution of um, the, what the, apparent, the injury looks like over time, they may have a lot of overlap in their appearance. Uh, here's another table uh, just demonstrating again that multiple different centers and authors have looked at uh, brain injury in children with congenital heart disease. Uh, again, demonstrating this, uh, this, this is very consistent now across uh, multiple studies that um, there is injury documented both before and after surgery. Um, and it does vary a little bit depending on what population is studied. You can see that some of them studied only neonates, whereas others included children up to six months of age. Uh, also, some um, studies included a broad range of congenital heart disease, whereas others took children that were highest risk, such as TGA and hypoplastic left heart. Generally speaking, about 30% of kids will have um, an arterial ischemic stroke um, in the neonatal period if they have congenital heart disease. And this is just, again, another picture. I included a lot of visuals here so people can just kind of get an understanding of what we're talking about. Um, so some of the infarcts uh, have a, a more classic embolic uh, appearance to them. So the top, so the, on the left-hand side, the top and bottom image are of a child who had an embolic infarct into the temporal lobe. And then the middle two images, top and bottom, is a an example of a child with watershed infarcts. So this child happens to have bilateral injury, but you can see that it is somewhat asymmetric. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see that there's um, an, another child who had probably an embolic infarct this time to the uh, posterior circulation. And that's to be distinguished from um, what the white matter infarcts look like. Um, and so I've just included these again for reference so people can have a visual of what we're, um, what we're trying to um, separate out in terms of cause and etiology and outcome. 
So uh, you can see on the sagittal view here on the top left-hand corner that there's some um, bright areas uh, within the white matter, and those are the white matter infarcts that, um, that are fairly typical for this population. Uh, on my very uh, poorly written yellow squiggly arrow, you can also see an, an example of a white matter infarct uh, on the top right-hand side of a coronal image of the MRI. Um, and then uh, each of the images um, on the bottom are a, a different view of the one that's above. So uh, going again back to the left, the, the top image there is a side-by-side -side view or a sagittal view of the white matter injury. And if you look right directly below it, this is an axial view of the same white matter injury. So just get a slightly different um, view of it by taking the MRI slices in a different angle. This is a paper done uh, from the CHOP group, and uh, they looked at children with congenital heart disease uh, who had uh, um, imaging before six months of age. So again, beyond the neonatal period, but still during infancy. And they tried to characterize what types of infarcts were occurring in ch children with congenital heart disease. And you can see there's a pretty broad range um, of different infarct patterns. Uh, again, uh, um, children were at risk for having uh, thromboembolic events uh, as well as watershed infarcts. I would say that the uh, case number one, um, which is a large MCA infarct, is somewhat atypical for what you'd see in the neonatal period. So the children that have a stroke around the time of birth, again, will have a large infarct like that, but a large infarct of this type in a child with congenital heart disease is less typical. So um, as children get older and they go through different stages of their cardiac repair, they become increasingly more likely to have a large infarct like that. So I would say, um, unlike the other studies that uh, look specifically at children that were neonates, because this one included children up to six months of age, I think they had a broader range of what um, the infarcts look like, uh, again, specifically, but they found some children that had larger infarcts, such as case number one. And there are the circles to show that the difference between a large infarct number one versus a smaller, more typical infarct, uh, case number 10. So again, thinking about neonatal arterial ischemic infarcts as opposed to perinatal, uh, we don't want to forget that uh, children uh, in the neonatal period are susceptible to, susceptible to infections, um, so that, and that includes bacterial meningitis. It's worth knowing that um, stroke is a, a fairly common complication of bacterial meningitis with about 17 to 43% of cases um, have been complicated by an arterial ischemic infarct. And GBS of, is a um, meningitis that specifically is a, poses a high risk for children to develop an arterial ischemic infarct. And these infarcts um, tend to um, be in areas where uh, small arteries uh, tend to be inflamed or infected. Um, so you'll very often see um, multiple ter territories being impacted. So um, when you think about the dis different distributions of where your larger arteries go, uh, that's not really the pattern that children with uh, GBS meningitis will follow. Uh, they, they just don't really have infarcts in a defined arterial distribution because um, the problem is inflammation of the smaller vessels. Uh, that being said, there is a predilection for um, uh, injury to the deep nuclei, uh, basal ganglia and thalami. And unfortunately, uh, the outcomes for these children are quite poor with up to 70% um, of, or more than 70% of children having a poor um, outcome with a high risk for death and uh, severe neurologic impairment. And I just included, um, again, a visual on the right-hand side so you can see what types of uh, uh, infarcts tend to be associated with an infection as opposed to um, like a cardioembolic source or a, um, uh, an embolic source presumed to have come from a placenta. It's not really a great um, way to sort of step off into the aspects of treatment because um, when children present in the neonatal period with an arterial ischemic infarct, there's often not a lot you can do except provide um, supportive care. So by the time a child shows up with symptoms, not only is the infarct well established, but very often the affected artery is patent. So if you think of, if you have a large clot in an artery and you have a stroke, there may be some territory that's not yet impacted and maybe you go in there and perform something like a thrombectomy. Turns out that by the time you image a child who has been diagnosed with a seizure, for example, um, the arteries are usually fully patent and there's really no intervention that is, um, can be applied. We always wanna make sure we do a diagnostic workup to really understand what is going on, if there are any associated um, risk factors that um, need to be um, diagnosed so that we can understand the risk for recurrence. Um, that being said, if you have a straightforward perinatal infarct, while we want to get an MRI, and in some cases, uh, in some centers, they always perform an MRA, 
Uh, we don't always need to do things like do a prothrombotic workup. So uh, in the past, many people thought that there was an underlying uh, prothrombotic disorder that may be causing this phenomenon. Um, and many centers have um, for years uh, obtained a comprehensive prothrombotic workup on these children. And it, it pretty uncommonly will demonstrate a prothrombotic problem. Um, there's also um, a very low risk of recurrence uh, in the children affected as well as their siblings. So moms who go on to have a second pregnancy really don't have an elevated risk for having a second child with a perinatal infarct. Uh, so again, that speaks to there's probably not an underlying prothrombotic disorder uh, as many of those things are in, uh, disorders are inherited. We do um, want to encourage um, folks to consider a cardiac workup. So uh, especially for children that may have a murmur or may appear otherwise well, uh, you want to make sure you don't have an underlying cardiac problem um, because, of course, that would change their, um, their outcome in, from, in, several, in several regards. So because children present with seizures, um, we do really want to have, have that be the focus of our care during the acute setting. Um, many children will not only have an isolated seizure, but they'll go on to have status epilepticus. Uh, so we want to be aggressive with our anti-seizure medications and with the goal there of minimizing secondary injury. Uh, continuous EEG monitoring is generally recommended. So um, vast majority of children will have um, a clinical event, but then once you give them a, a, a medication to treat their seizures, if they have um, additional seizures, they are very often electrographic only. So um, just a good rule of thumb is if you give a baby a seizure medication and then they clinically stop seizing, uh, that's kind of a smoke and mirrors phenomenon. So it looks like the seizures have stopped, but if you put an EEG on, they're very often continuing to have seizures, even though you can't see it in the child. So whenever you um, suspect that a child's had seizures, especially if you're gonna give a medication, you always wanna pair it up with continuous EEG monitoring, probably for at least 24 hours. And early symptomatic seizures usually do stop within a few days. So sometimes we have to be aggressive with our seizure medications and some children will even require multiple uh, anti-seizure medications. That being said, um, the seizures do not usually persist. And so most children can actually be weaned off of all of their, se their seizure medications prior to discharge. This is a little bit of a change from the last, I'd say 10 to 15 years where people used to go home and for several months they would stay on seizure medications or in some cases people would leave them on for, for a long time because the future risk of developing epilepsy was so high. But the trend these days is actually to take them off seizure medications. And part of the reason for that is that when children um, do eventually develop epilepsy, it's usually not for about um, four years after their initial infarct. So um, the understanding there is just that there's no point in continuing to take a medication for several years if your risk for having a seizure is actually uh, pretty low. So what are the outcomes for children who have arterial ischemic infarcts? About 25 to 45% will have impairments that impact their academic performance and or daily life. And what, so what does that look like? What does that mean? Um, well, most children that have a perinatal infarct, especially if it's the kind that we presume comes from the placenta, um, they almost uniformly will have a hemiparesis. Um, and um, for this uh, stroke type, it's usually uh, that the child is more affected with use of the hand than the leg. So you'll very often see a child that has very poor use of the hand and the arm, um, but walks with just a little bit of asymmetry in their gait, or they may have uh, you know, a tight ankle and, and maybe an orthotic of some, of some sort. Uh, almost all of the children work. I very rarely see a child who has uh, a classic perinatal infarct who does not ambulate. Usually that means that there's something else going on there. And in terms of their cognitive functions, they usually have normal speech. Um, they usually have uh, normal IQs, though they do have problems with higher cognitive function. So um, children with perinatal infarcts very often will, will do well from a developmental standpoint, from the uh, standpoint of uh, cognition and language until they reach uh, school age where uh, increased demands of, of being organized and uh, multitasking uh, start to demonstrate some of their deficits. So they have problems with attention, executive function, processing speed, et cetera, et cetera. Only about 8% um, of children will be uh, designated as severe, moderately or severely impaired at two-year follow-up. And again, uh, these are often the children that are not the perinatal infarcts that I showed you earlier, where you presume it comes to the placenta and they're otherwise well. These are usually the children that have had a neonatal uh, infarct where they have either a cardiac problem or um, a, a CNS infection. It is worth knowing that the risk for epilepsy later is very high. So when you're counseling families about outcomes, you, you want to include that there's a high risk for seizures later on. About 54% of kids will go on to develop epilepsy at some point. Um, and it does seem um, from the literature that is emerging that if you have acute seizures, that that um, might be a, a signature that 
uh, lets you know that your risk for developing seizures later on um, may be as high as 69% uh, by 10 year follow up. Go to this slide from um, a group that I work with out of uh, the Georgetown Plasticity Center. So this is just to kind of speak to the elements of speech. So if you have a hemispheric infarct where you take out the centers for language on the left where most people have language, how can it be that a child that has such a large infarct will go on to have normal language? Uh, and it turns out that the, um, the brain is an incredibly plastic thing. And if you have an infarct at an early age, um, and you take out um, the areas that we would presume would be designated for speech on one side, um, that the other side in a homotopic area will actually take on language and language development will be normal. So again, um, this is a phenomenon that um, you can only um, take the advantage of if you have a, um, a unilateral infarct. So children who have bilateral infarcts where both sides are injured uh, do not benefit from um, their youth um, at, in terms of recovery. If you have a unilateral infarct, however, uh, usually the outcomes are quite good um, because the brain, brain is so plastic at that point. I'm gonna transition now to periventricular venous infarcts. Uh, so what is a periventricular venous infarct? Well, it's, a, it's an infarct that um, the brain has ischemic injury in a territory that is not um, in a um, arterial distribution. So um, the mechanism here is that you have veins that become congested and then blood cannot flow uh, in and out in a normal pattern, and then you develop injury um, secondary to this venous obstruction. Um, and um, in a child uh, who, in the neonatal period, um, the way that you can distinguish one from the other is a couple of different ways. So um, first and foremost, if you um, take a picture, you can appreciate there are some differences in the pattern. So even though the territories may have a somewhat of a similar appearance, um, usually the venous infarcts tend to be around the ventricle as opposed to an arterial ischemic infarct, which very often will uh, have a significant involvement of the cortex. And um, the mechanisms for a venous infarct tend to be a little bit different. So if you imagine um, in a child who um, uh, either uh, is premature or uh, this phenomenon can occur in utero, or prior to 34 weeks, the germinal matrix is still exposed. Um, and if there is a hemorrhage in that territory, you can have blood that then compresses on the medullary veins. So this is kind of like a, a whole cascade of events here where you have um, in a, a premature infant, you're getting a bleeding, which then the hematoma will put pressure on the veins, which then become congested and then lead to what's called a venous infarct. So if you look on the right-hand side here of the MRI, you can see a white arrow. And that area of whiteness uh, around the ventricle, so the, the ventricle itself is sort of the solid white, and then adjacent to it, you can see this whitish uh, territory. And that um, is a demonstration of a venous infarct, um, presumably from a prior germinal matrix hemorrhage. So to kind of make the point a little bit more there, I uh, pulled up this diagram here of like, what are medullary veins? So uh, when you think about, um, the, the blood flow to the brain, we have the arteries that bring the blood in, and then of course it goes, the blood goes through the capillaries and then to the veins. And we have these uh, larger veins that then uh, channel into these smaller, um, uh, sorry, the smaller veins then channel into the bigger um, draining veins, and then of course the sinuses. So um, these smaller little veins uh, have specific names, um, and in the neonate, uh, the ones that are most commonly affected by this phenomenon are called the medullary veins. And so I've circled those here on the diagram here. Uh, and you can see that they are um, right adjacent to the ventricle, which is uh, kind of in the middle on the left-hand side there. Just uh, like you can see in this um, brain MRI here, this is a coronal view, so a front-to-back view of the brain. And you can see on this picture that there is a large area of whiteness here where the, the ventricle on the, um, the, the right of the picture, but the left of the child, um, does not appear the same as on the other side. Uh, and that is because there's injury there um, and uh, the injured brain, as it um, starts to evolve, will become liquefied and, and just extend into the ventricle. So this, the space um, where the injured brain wants just gets taken up by CSF, um, and that would be consistent with a um, periventricular venous infarct. <clears throat> um, so uh, venous infarcts uh, tend to damage the corticospinal tract. So the, the more um, prominent feature for um, children with venous infarcts is that they have um, uh, prominent motor symptoms. Um, and unlike a arterial ischemic infarct, um, it's not usually the hand that's predominantly affected, it's usually the reverse. So usually you have a lot more um, 
uh, challenges with uh, motor movements in the lower extremities as compared to the upper extremities. And the incidence of a perinatal venous infarct is difficult to determine. And this is for two reasons. I think, um, one, there's just a, a paucity of studies here. And two, I think this phenomenon was a little bit slower, <clears throat> excuse me, slower to be recognized. Um, many children were um, recently being recognized to have perinatal infarcts. And again, as I said, around 2005 to eight, we were just starting to put registries together of children showing up with strokes. Um, and periventricular venous infarcts very often show up with early handedness. So children will go home and then they'll show up later on and they'll have some asymmetry in their motor movements. And for a long time, the focus was trying to understand what are perinatal arterial ischemic infarcts. Um, and people were occasionally noticing, oh, this, this pattern is different, but um, it did take some time for people to start collectively looking at these kids. Um, and I think we, we still have uh, a bit to learn about um, the venous infarcts uh, that present uh, outside of the neonatal period. Unlike arterial ischemic infarcts, um, when you look back at the uh, delivery records, it doesn't seem to be um, uh, much in the way to suggest that there are problems with uh, intrapartum intra pardon complications or a difficult transition. So usually these kids tend to have a pretty unremarkable birth. Um, and then, you know, to kind of trace back of like, why do we think that the whole cause of this problem is a germinal matrix hemorrhage? Well, uh, as imaging has improved, uh, we have increased ability to detect uh, evidence of a prior hemorrhage. So we have sequences now that will uh, be able to detect uh, hemosiderin, um, again, evidence that there had been a prior um, uh, hemorrhage uh, in the area, which uh, now has ischemic injury due to presumably a venous infarction. Uh, again, I think just to kind of get a visual of um, what we're talking about for these different things. So I put a diagram here together um, that kind of walks through the process there. So um, point number one, this is the um, this is the germinal matrix that presumably has the, the bleed. And then uh, adjacent to it, you have the medullary veins. Those are all the blue things kind of coming, uh, draining all the blood um, next to the ventricles that then become compressed, um, then leading to a venous infarction and uh, backflow of blood. And then um, to demonstrate why you would present with motor symptoms, um, this diagram has included the dotted lines that demonstrate um, the motor pathways um, for the lower extremity. So that kind of um, you know, hopefully um, kind of spells out not only the time frame there and the mechanism, but also the location involved. Um, and then I just uh, included the other half of that, which is just to show you later on, on an um, MRI, when you have kind of a, uh, a porn sphalic cyst there, you know, what, what was the beginning of all of that? Um, so if you trace back to the um, diagram on the left-hand side and think of going through steps one through three, and then the final step being this MRI that you can see on the other side where the tissue is injured and has now just become CSF. Um, this is a um, table here from an article that just kind of put together a comparison of children that um, present with early handedness or, or motor challenges um, and put side by side um, a presumed arterial infarct versus a perinatal infarct. So children presenting similarly um, but thought to have a, a different mechanism. So um, you can see that the children with the periventricular um, venous infarct, um, which is the, the light gray bar on the right-hand side of each of those three different uh, areas, um, they are much more likely to show up with a motor deficit. And if you compare that to seizure, um, they usually don't have seizures um, and they, very, um, they also are, are less likely to, to have, a little bit less likely to have um, the, um, I'm sorry, um, they're a little bit more likely to have some uh, developmental delays. The, um, the reason that they're not having seizures is that the, the territory involved tends to be white matter. Um, and usually when a child is gonna go on to develop epilepsy or even acute symptomatic seizures, it's because the territory involved um, uh, includes the cortex, which is usually uh, the location where seizures are generated from. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that um, because um, in some, so for some children, the primary problem is thought to be a hemorrhage in the germinal matrix. There are other children where the problem is thought to be that there's actually just an isolated thrombosis within the, the cerebral veins. So if you have an MRI that does not include hemosiderin to suggest that there had been a prior hemorrhage, you do want to make sure that you include a prothrombotic workup into their um, diagnostic study. So 
this is the one time where um, we, we've sort of already worked out that most children with a perinatal infarct don't have an underlying prothrombotic disorder. And the exception to that would be um, a child with a venous infarct that doesn't have a clear, that doesn't have clear evidence on imaging of a prior hemorrhage. Um, and then um, because of the, the mechanism here, it's not a, a clot in an artery, uh, these children uh, tend to not really have an associated cardiac disease. So if you have a child with a venous infarct, you usually don't need to do an additional cardiac uh, workup such as an echo. Um, I'm gonna move on to cerebral sinovenous thrombosis, which has a lot of overlap to venous infarctions. Um, um, but there are some, some differences here in terms of presentation. So um, there, there are, as I said earlier, um, uh, there are cerebral veins and then there are cerebral sinuses, which are really just large veins. Um, and you can have clots in um, one or both. Um, and when a clot is um, sufficiently big or in a, in a vital location, you can develop uh, venous congestion. And because of that uh, obstruction of flow of blood, you can end up with a venous infarction. So include some diagrams here just to um, walk through the anatomy a little bit. So across the top of the head, we have our superior sagittal sinus. And then coming around the back, we have um, the, the, the singular sinus that comes across the top of the head divides up into two. And um, in babies, there are some uh, relatively common places where clots can show up. So around the back of the head where the sinus divides into two, uh, the transverse sinuses, uh, that's a fairly common place for a baby to um, have a thrombus. Um, this a thrombus in this area, though, um, can be somewhat well tolerated. There are lots of ways for the blood to exit the head if you have um, injury in one of those sinuses. So, for example, um, if the blood is divided up into two and you have obstruction on one side, the blood just goes to the other side. This is a little bit different than, say, if you have a superior sagittal sinus. So, uh, you know, at the top of the head, we have one big draining vein. And usually um, children will tolerate a clot in there fairly well, except for if the clot starts to extend into what we call the cortical veins. So once you start um, having areas that have um, not duplication in their um, venous system, then that's when you get into trouble with, where the blood really can't exit the head and things become congested. Um, I'm gonna maybe go to this slide here and then I'll go backwards. So an example of that would be, if you think of, um, again, those cortical veins coming off the top of the sagittal sinus, uh, you can see here on the CT that if a cortical vein um, gets thrombosed or if multiple get thrombosed, you get this venous congestion. Um, so you have, and that would show up as a, a hypo density on a CAT scan. Hopefully we're not getting too many CAT scans on babies, but um, uh, this, this is one here where you see that there uh, is a hypodensity associated um, adjacent to the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, so it looks like there's a clot in a cortical vein. And then just by nature of what um, this, this phenomenon is, very often once the veins become sufficiently, sufficiently congested, they'll actually develop a hemorrhage. So um, venous infarcts are notorious for having a hemorrhagic complication. Uh, so actually, this can be kind of full circle. So in a child where the primary problem is journal matrix hemorrhage, they can then have clotting in the veins and then ischemic infarction from the venous congestion and then back again to, to hemorrhage. Um, and, you know, from the article that I pulled here, it said that venous infarcts occur in about 50% of kids who have CSVT. And I, I don't know if I believe that to be true, quite honestly. I think some of this has to do with um, so some selection bias. I think the more that we do routine imaging for high-risk populations, the more that we realize that there are, are a host of kids who actually have clots in various places, but don't necessarily let us know because they're asymptomatic. We wouldn't know unless we did this um, uh, imaging for um, underlying cause. There is um, a, a phenomenon where sometimes you get obstruction of um, veins in the deep venous system. So uh, veins that are close to the deep nuclei um, or the, the basal ganglia or the thalami. Um, and when that happens, um, this is a, an area that is, uh, does not tolerate um, venous congestion very well. And so um, if you see a thalamic hemorrhage in a baby, um, that, that's sort of a, a signal that um, that child may have an underlying um, clot in the venous system, um, which then is causing um, the hemorrhages. So again, because a, a baby's germinal matrix will um, will no longer be um, uh, adjacent to the, um, the ventricles after 33, 34 weeks of age. 
it's it really at that point should not be a source of hemorrhage. So if you have a baby that shows up and has an IVH and they're a full term baby and the hemorrhage looks acute, um, that's probably not a germinal matrix hemorrhage. That's probably actually a baby that has a clot in the deep venous system um, and has a secondary hemorrhage as uh, part of its complications. So what is the incidence of neonatal CSUT? I think this is a somewhat of a uh, moving target, partly for the reasons that I just said, where uh, the more we image, the more we're realizing that there are some incidental CSUTs um, and we're still learning what to do with those. Uh, there is a male predominance. Uh, again, children may be in asymptomatic, but they may also present with a seizure or encephalopathy. And some of that depends um, on uh, how extensive the clot is. So if a clot is just sitting in a vein, but the baby is able to otherwise compensate well, they may have no symptoms. Um, and if you're starting to get venous congestion, then you may start having symptoms um, such as seizure or encephalopathy. What are the risk factors for developing a CSVT? So a child who um, has a complicated delivery course may have comp um, some hypoxia or premature rupture of membranes, internal infection, and that shows up in about 50% of kids in the neonatal period, or in the perinatal period, sorry. Um, in children who um, may be neonates, but maybe not necessarily uh, peripartum, they dehydration uh, shows up as a significant risk factor, as does head and neck disorders and CNS infections. Uh, prothrombotic disorders show up in about 20% of kids, so that's a, a high enough number that we probably should be looking for an underlying prothrombotic disorder. Uh, cardiac kids also um, can develop CSVT. I, um, these children tend to have uh, more of an incidental finding of the CSVT, and I'm going to explore that a little bit more in a minute. And then one other thing to know, there's a good amount of variability internationally about how do we um, put lines into children, but it's worth knowing that um, veins in the neck in particular uh, are a risk factor for developing a CSVT in a neonate. So here are a couple of examples here, again, of just, you know, what do clots look like in babies? So the picture on the left is a um, thrombus in the straight sinus. Um, and you can see there's a little bit of uh, increased signal adjacent to that. So uh, that's probably a, uh, a baby who has um, a clot also in the transverse sinus. So uh, again, having a, an isolated clot in a big sinus doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna end up with a venous infarct, um, but it is something that you probably wanna trend over time, especially if you're gonna choose not to anticoagulate. The picture on the right is um, a really striking picture of a baby that has uh, thrombosis in the medullary vein. So you could, that just kind of tells you the full spectrum. I would say very often it tends to be bilateral and anterior, but really it can occur um, anterior or posterior and, uh, and certainly can be bilateral. What is the treatment for CSVT? Well, um, uh, children, uh, so you, you think if you have a clot in a big sinus, should you go in there and um, provide TPA or thrombolysis? Turns out that those medications don't work very well on the, um, on the venous side, unless you do an IR procedure. So generally speaking, thrombolysis is not, um, these patients are not eligible for thrombolysis. Um, anticoagulation, however, um, can be a good option for these kids. Um, and even in the context of them having an intracranial hemorrhage, um, it's a little counterintuitive that if you have a hemorrhage, why would you be providing anticoagulation? Well, the answer is that you want to get to the underlying source of the bleeding. And so, um, especially in older children and adults, there's pretty good evidence to suggest that even in the context of hemorrhage, you should be anticoagulating. Um, the prognosis actually is fairly good, especially if you don't go on to have a venous infarct. So um, most kids will recanalize by three months, about 90% of them. Um, and I'm kind of running out of time here. I'm just going to uh, quickly go through these couple of slides and then get to the conclusions. Uh, this is a study that we uh, have uh, submitted for publication that just looks at children with congenital heart disease who had imaging before and after surgery. About 4% of them have an incidental finding of a CSVT. So that's just something to be aware of that you may see that. And then I don't think there's good data at this point to figure out whether we should be anticoagulating those kids or not. Um, and then I'm just gonna kind of get to the education and advocacy piece. So when I started the stroke clinic um, in 2007 in Children's National, we had nowhere to send families and the internet was kind of like this deep, dark, gloomy place. And things have really changed a lot. There's been a lot of advocacy, a lot of parent groups that have focused on the positive. So there are now um, a variety of places to send people to get information and also to network with other parents. So um, the one thing that um, used to show up a lot that is um, occurring less and less is that you know, people would see this very large infarct in a baby and then the parents would be told that their kid is never gonna walk, talk, go to school or have friends and people would be devastated. And then as the child went through different developmental stages, the reality was that they actually just had a hemiparesis, which is not to belittle the hemiparesis, but certainly is a much different outcome um, than, than the, you know, the, the description of being in a persistent vegetative state, essentially. 
Um, so we now have places to send patients and hopefully uh, people are educated a little bit more about what the outcomes are um, and that we should really guide parents that this is um, something that you can, it's a kind of a chronic disorder that you can work with. It's not catastrophic per se. So what are the conclusions? Um, perinatal, perinatal strokes really come into three different groups, arterial ischemic infarcts, cerebral synovenous thrombosis, and intracranial hemorrhage. In a baby, they have very limited ways to let you know that they have a problem. And in the neonatal period, it's usually seizures. Um, they don't usually have a hemiparesis in the neonatal, neonatal period. It's not until motor skills start developing that they let you know they have a hemiparesis. So this is a little bit confusing for parents where you send someone home and you tell them that ultimately they're gonna have weakness on one side, even though for the first four months of life, they don't see that hemiparesis. So it's just managing expectations for them. Um, treatment is largely supportive. Um, the exception there would be that if you have a baby with a CSVT, you may want to consider anticoagulation. And that the outcomes um, do have variability depending on the size, location, and type of stroke. Um, but for most patients, will involve a hemiparetic cerebral palsy. Um, and in cases that um, gray matter injury is involved, uh, epilepsy can be expected in probably about most. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter, for, uh, for that talk. Um, super informative. I uh, want to just see if anyone um, had any questions for Dr. Carpenter. You can feel free to unmute yourself or I can unmute you as well. Hi, I had a question. Dr. Carpenter, I'm Francesca Coley, one of the neonatologists in the group. That was a fantastic um, overview of strokes. Um, when you mentioned that CSVT actually should be what we consider when we see IVH in term babies, mm -hmm. the other thing I've been taught conventionally was that we should consider cord plexus bleeds as the root of um, IVH in term babies. Is that inaccurate or are they just on the spectrum? I am less familiar with that, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, I'm less familiar with that. Um, you mean like outside the context of having like a tumor or something, right? Yeah, I think the, the, the current thinking is that it's probably less the case and it's probably more likely to be an underlying trauma uh, in the deep cerebral vein. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, Dr. Carpenter, one question that did come up, um, and it's something that uh, our next presenter, Dr. Yazbek, might have some thoughts on as well. There was a question of when you're uh, looking at the MRIs, um, kind of how to differentiate between um, a ischemic stroke and HIE findings. Uh, um, and by that question, do you mean like watershed infarcts? Well, let me see if I can, let me see if I can kind of just uh, take it at face value. So um, the arterial ischemic infarcts, um, they, if you have bilateral, so let's see here. So sometimes the territory is very clear. Like it's in an arterial distribution. It looks like if you can imagine a wedge where like if an artery was to be blocked, the wedge behind it now has injury. So sometimes it'll have a classic pattern where you just sort of, know the, the anatomy matches where the infarct is. Um, I think it becomes a little bit more tricky. So when you have a unilateral injury, you know, just one side affected, it's a little easier to presume there was something wrong with the artery, either it was compressed or um, something, there was something foreign in it, like a clot. I think it becomes a little bit more tricky when you start having bilateral infarcts um, and definitely more tricky when it starts to include um, watershed territory. So some watershed territories are kind of classically defined, but I think if you think of a baby in vulnerable areas that sometimes include different parts of the white matter, uh, I do th think it can get um, a little tricky. You know, um, hypoxic ischemic injury, um, you know, also has kind of classic patterns. So um, I think that some, there are challenges where the two meet in the in-between, right? So there's the classic examples that you read in a textbook, and then there's real life where the, um, the two have some overlap. And, but of course, if, if you, you know, in real life, um, children don't have injuries that come from textbooks, right? So if you have a child who has um, distress around birth, um, they may actually have combined uh, pattern, they might, may have injury of combined types, right? So they may have some watershed injury, and then they may also have some basal ganglia injury. So it's, it's sometimes a little tricky. And I think the, the best way to sort that out is to try and go to your resources. So like the, the neuroradiologists are really great at looking at patterns of injury especially if you give them clinical cues, uh, clues to try and piece it all together. I think that, that can kind of get you to the, getting to your most likely outcome. I do think I'll just kind of add, I think 
Um, I think that uh, head ultrasounds are great screening tools because you can do them repeatedly and they're at the bedside and they're cheap and they're um, benign. But I do think um, when you're trying to understand mechanisms and, and prognosticate, your best bet is to go with an MRI. Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, if there aren't any other questions for Dr. Carpenter, um, thank you again, Dr. Carpenter. Um, we will go right into our next presentation, um, which will be Dr. Yazbek discussing um, some basics of neural imaging. So Dr. Yazbek, if you just wanted to uh, give a quick intro um, and then go ahead. Okay. Hello, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. So uh, I'm a pediatric neuroradiologist. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, uh, we're gonna review uh, uh, the neonatal brain imaging. So I will start by uh, talking about the imaging modalities that we have uh, and that are available. I won't be able to go in the detail of each uh, pathology uh, because we don't have enough time. We only have 30 minutes. But I would like to uh, to show you when should we use ultrasound, when should we use MRI, and when can we use CT of the head in neonatal uh, brain imaging. Uh, so this is a radiograph of the brain. We uh, very rarely uh, use it. Uh, sometimes you can use it if we have skull malformation like in this baby here. This is a 3D reformat from a CT of the brain. Uh, this is an axial non-contrast CT of the head. And so you can show the defect in the bone and the brain parenchyma as well. Uh, a coronal T2 uh, from an MRI of the brain and an ultrasound of the brain. So I will start by ultrasound. So ultrasound is really the first modality that we can use. It's convenient, it's non-invasive, it has a low cost, no radiation for the kids. We can repeat it as much as we want. It's very sensitive for hemorrhage, for periventricular leukomalacia, but not in the very early uh, stage of uh, the PVL. Uh, for hydrocephalus and evaluation of the size of the ventricles, are they increasing in size or not? So ultrasound is really very good for that. It can also be helpful for cerebral perfusion because we can, uh, calculate the resistive index in the brain and uh, see if the perfusion is okay or if it is deteriorating. We can also look at the parenchymal abnormalities. So what are the cons of uh, the ultrasound? So it's operator dependent, right? So it depends on the person doing the ultrasound. Sometimes there are uh, like pathologies that can be missed depending on the condition of the examination. And it's less sensitive to uh, abnormalities at the level of the brain scan. And it can also be less sensitive, it's surely less sensitive than MRI for uh, the ischemic abnormalities like HIE or uh, the uh, arterial ischemic uh, strokes uh, uh, early on. So this is the technique of uh, the study. So we have the operator that will go at the bed of the patient especially in the NICU. And we will use the anterior fontanelle to do our imaging. And so we will be able to acquire coronal planes through the brain and sagittal, uh, sagittal uh, images uh, through the brain. So I will show you uh, some uh, images of normal anatomy so you can uh, see what you're looking at. So we start anteriorly. Those are the orbits. And we have the frontal lobes, OK? Um, uh, those are the sulci and the gyri and the extra axial space there and the white matter. So uh, on ultrasound, especially in premature kids, the white matter should be more echoic uh, than uh, more echogenic than uh, the gray matter. Uh, the white line here is uh, actually the PR. Uh, we go back a little bit. We start seeing the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle. Uh, the star here is uh, the cavum uh, septum pellucidum, 
which we usually usually see in uh, in kids when they are born. Okay, so this is just a normal variant, and it's most frequently seen. Uh, and it will occlude later on in life, so we will have the septum pellucidum without this cavity here. Uh, the caudate head, the putamen, the globus pallidus, those are the temporal horns of the lateral ventricle. So on this view, we can start looking at the ventricle and see if they are large or not. We, we go back to the level of the for foramen of Monroe bilaterally, so we have the caudate nucleus, and now we start having the thalamus, because here in the midline we have the third ventricle, and this area over here is really important uh, because it's the codothalamic groove. And when we have a germinal matrix hemorrhage, uh, we will have a focus of echogenicity at this level. So we really need to appreciate uh, uh, the codothalamic groove on the frontal uh, images. Uh, we, we are starting to see the cerebellum. So this, this is a coronal view, okay? Uh, we go back more, we have the basal cistern, the temporal lobe, the cerebellum, and the ventricles. And here at that level, uh, the white uh, images within the ventricles are the current plexus. So this is completely normal posteriorly. We shouldn't see uh, echogenic uh, material anteriorly anterior to the foramina of Monroe. So you should never have that in the frontal horn of uh, the lateral ventricle. But here, posteriorly, it should look like that, but it should be regular and not like bumpy, because if it's bumpy and irregular, that means that we have blood in the ventricle. And more posteriorly, we can again see uh, the extra axial spaces. Uh, to have a better look at the extra axial spaces, we can actually use a superficial transducer uh, that will better show us uh, the superior sagittal sinus, for instance, and uh, if there is a subdural hemorrhage or high uh, After acquiring the coronal views, we can uh, get uh, our sagittal images, okay, through the anterior fontanelle as well. And this is a very important view. So this is the sagittal view in the midline showing the corpus callosum, and we need to make sure that it is complete. The vermis of the cerebellum, and the vermis is usually white on ultrasound, it's epigenic. Uh, the pond, that should look like that. The third ventricle over here. So this uh, image, we, uh, we should really study it very carefully to rule out any congenital mal malformation at this level. Uh, we go back, we go like more laterally to the midline, and this is the codothalamic proof, so the caudate nucleus, the thalamus, and at that level, we need to appreciate uh, if there is a uh, hemorrhage uh, here, this is the choroid plexus, okay? So the choroid plexus or the echogenicity in the ventricle should not extend anterior to the codothalamic groove, because if it does, that means that uh, the hemorrhage has extended, the, extended into the ventricle. More laterally, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and temporal lobe, and sylvian fissure. Uh, so, have, so we have around like four windows to image the brain. In uh, neonatal uh, babies, we can use the posterior fontanelle as well if, you, if we do not have a good view of uh, the parietal and occipital lobes. We can use the mastoid uh, window, and we usually use it for evaluation of the posterior fossa. The temporal windows, window, we don't use it as much, so mainly it's the anterior fontanelle and the mastoid window. So this view is from the mastoid window, and this is the posterior fossa with the cerebellum over here, the lateral ventricles here. So the, so the cerebellar hemispheres are here, and this is the posterior fossa. Uh, this is a regular coronal view. So if you look carefully, so we always look for symmetry in the brain. And at that level, we have uh, like a hypoechoic nodule uh, surrounded by echogenic uh, material in the right cerebellar hemisphere. And this is confirmed on the uh, transmastoid window. And this was a small hemorrhage in uh, the right cerebellar hemisphere. Um, so we can also do a Doppler examination to look for the vessels and if they are open or not. So those are the anterior cerebral arteries, the middle cerebral arteries, and the carotid arteries on the right and on the left. We can also study uh, the velocity within the arteries and the resistance index. Uh, 
uh, in the brain. This is a sagittal view that shows us nicely the anterior cerebral arteries. And this is with a superficial transducer showing the flow in the superior sagittal sinus. So we can also use ultrasound to rule out uh, venous thrombosis. Uh, so as I told you earlier, uh, the white matter in the brain is white on ultrasound, while the gray matter is darker than the white matter usually. And the pia will look uh, bright externally and will cover uh, the gray matter. So this is the normal appearance uh, on ultrasound. Uh, this is important because in ischemic injury, in diffuse ischemic injury, we will start having cerebral edema, so the brain will, will swell, and we will lose uh, this differentiation on, uh, on ultrasound. And this can be really subtle, so if we are not used to the normal appearance, uh, sometimes we can miss it. In this case, it's not as subtle. So uh, if you look at the gray matter, it's whiter than the white matter on ultrasound. And so there's something really wrong going on, and it's diffuse. And this was uh, diffuse cortical necrosis in a five-week-old girl who had uh, septic shock. Um, another abnormality, so as I told you before, usually uh, we look for symmetry in the brain. And this can help us find the abnormality. But sometimes the abnormality is bilateral, as in HIE, for instance. So in this case, if you look at the thalamus, it looks very white, OK? But it's bilateral, and it's symmetrical. So we can miss it. But this is not the normal appearance of the thalamus, actually. So let me go back to a coronal view and look at the thalamus. It shouldn't be that white. So in this baby, uh, that means that we have an injury bilaterally at the level of the thalami. And this baby had HIE. Um, so uh, uh, the MRI confirmed uh, the presence of restricted diffusion in the thalami and the bilateral vitamina. So uh, what are, what's the pathology that we're looking for on ultrasound, and how does it look? So uh, calcifications are going to be echogenic, okay, and we usually see them in infection and in metabolic disease. Uh, so it's going to be bright signal on the ultrasound. Uh, other pathologies are also going to give bright signal or hyper echoic uh, images on ultrasound, and these are the hemorrhages, but also the ischemia and the tumor. So, like all the abnormalities will be hyperechoic on ultrasound. Whenever they will start to be more chronic, they will start showing as hypoechogenicity in the brain because we will start having gliosis and cystic transformation. So, the sequela of hemorrhage and ischemia will uh, show as hypoechoic uh, images on ultrasound, and the uh, presence of cysts uh, naturally will be hypoechoic. Um, so what are the indications of uh, the brain ultrasound? So in three terms, we are looking for PVL, for germinal matrix hemorrhage, for intraventricular hemorrhage or extraaxial hemorrhage. In term babies, we want usually to rule out hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, but also hemorrhages. So as I told you earlier, uh, the ultrasound can be done as a screening uh, exam, and it can also be repeated, repeated multiple times for following up the size of the ventricle, the hemorrhages, the PVL, the periventricular leukomalacia. So uh, in this context, sonography is really ideal. So uh, I will spend some, some time sometimes show, discussing the germinal matrix hemorrhage because it's like the most uh, common indication and also the most common abnormalities that we will see on ultrasound. So we should be looking for echogenic focus in the codotalamic groove and echogenicity anterior to the foramen of Monroe in the ventricles. So those are all the images, but just to show you the, uh, the caudate nucleus, the thalamus, and that's the codotalamic groove on a coronal image. And on a sagittal image, we're looking in this region. So this is like a drawing of uh, what we should expect on the sagittal view. 
co uh, caudate nucleus, thalamus, and we're looking at this region over here. And uh, superior to it, we have the lateral ventricle. So that's the lateral ventricle, that's the choroid plexus, caudate nucleus, thalamus. We shouldn't have this focus of echogenicity here. This is a grade one germinal matrix hemorrhage. In the coronal uh, view, so lateral ventricle, lateral ventricles, those are the frontal boards of the lateral ventricle. So caudate nucleus and thalamus, and that's the caudothalamic roof. So here the caudothalamic roof is okay. We don't have echogenic material here. But on the left, we have this large nodule of uh, hypoechoic material that's a grade one germinal matrix hemorrhage on the left. So uh, what's the evolution of the uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage? Usually it might completely resolve and we won't see anything. It might leave a small echogenic focus that is a uh, gliosis, or it can give a sub In this case, we still have a small nodule of echogenicity, uh, which is uh, gliosis. And in this case, in the sagittal plane, we have this hypoechoic uh, nodule, which is a sub cyst in the area of required grade one germinal matrix hemorrhage. So what's the grading system uh, we use in our reports? So whenever we just have a germinal matrix hemorrhage, it's a grade one. Whenever we, the hemorrhage extends into the ventricles, it's a grade two. If the ventricles are increased in size, we start talking about the grade three. And if we have a grade three, so a germinal matrix with extension into the ventricle and enlargement of the ventricles, and uh, extension or presence of uh, hemorrhage in the in the brain parenchyma, well, we uh, talk about grade four uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage. So uh, I, I showed you images about hemorrhage uh, on ultrasound uh, and ischemia. Uh, when so when do we use the CT? So usually we don't like to use the CT in uh, babies because of the radiation issues, right? So we don't want uh, to give the baby a lot of radiation. Uh, plus, uh, the, the baby's brain usually is high, has a high water content. So evaluation of the white matter is very difficult on CT. Uh, CT will really be helpful for hemorrhages, especially if it's a life-threatening condition and like we need uh, images uh, really fast uh, to, to, to know what to do. Uh, so we can get the CT. Uh, CT can also help for the calcifications in the brain. So in case we're suspecting like torsion infection and we want to rule out calcification, CT is the best modality for the calcification. It's, it's even better than MRI and uh, surely better than ultrasound. Uh, CT can also help us uh, evaluate uh, the skull of the baby. So for the bony abnormalities and the calcification, CT is the best. So this is a contrast axial CT image of uh, the brain, and that's a T2 image on MRI. And you can see the difference. So here we really can see the white matter and the gray white matter differentiation. And we, so if there's an abnormality there, we will really be uh, evaluating it uh, nicely. While on CT, uh, this is more difficult because of the high uh, water content of the brain parenchyma. So in this case, for instance, uh, those are uh, ultrasound images showing echogenic material in the ventricle anteriorly. So as I told you, we should never have this appearance here on the sagittal image anterior to the foramen of Monroe. And that's the CT in the baby uh, showing extensive uh, hemorrhage into the ventricle with a, a cerebral edema, so the extra axial spaces are completely effaced in this case. Uh, this is another uh, another baby, and we have those small bright dots, hyperdense uh, nodules adjacent to the ventricles, and these are calcifications that tell us that the baby had probably an intrauterine infection. Uh, so uh, really the indications for CT are very uh, limited. Uh, and we try not to use CT in uh, these babies. Let's move on to MRI now. So MRI is uh, an excellent uh, modality for evaluation of uh, the ischemic brain injuries and the 
hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Uh, it can be done uh, as early as uh, one to two days of age. We don't like to do it earlier, so we don't like to do it in the first 24 hours because it can be negative while the baby can really have like uh, severe injury to the brain and the diffusion can be completely negative. It's totally different than in adults. So we tell you that in adults, whenever they have a stroke, like the diffusion will be, uh, will show abnor an abnormality really early on as like 30 minutes after uh, the, the stroke, for instance. In babies, it's not the case. Diffusion might be completely normal the first 24 hours. So we like to do our MRIs uh, in, after the first day or the second day of life. Uh, diffusion will stay positive till around 20, uh, eight days. Okay, after seven days, the ADC will start to normalize. So the ADC uh, is a map that we use with the diffusion to be able uh, to read the diffusion sequence. I will show you an example. Uh, after seven days, uh, ADC can start uh, to uh, look normal again. So we will miss the changes. MR spectroscopy also can help. Uh, it will show us uh, an increase in the lactate, and in case we have also a decreased NAA. Uh, the NAA usually reflects uh, the, the neurons in the brain, so whenever we have a decreased NAA, that means that we have a poor prognosis. What are the cons of the MRI? The availability. So uh, we need to have an available uh, MRI time slot, especially that these studies take uh, some time. Not because the MRI will take a lot of time, because it needs uh, a, a lot of preparation to have the room and uh, the technologists like available to scan the babies, um, <laughs> and uh, we can uh, like change the protocol and uh, and like uh, do a special protocol for each case. We try not to leave the baby a lot a long time in the magnet, so we usually use. Uh, the shortest protocol available, but we start to do, uh, we try to do the sequences that we need the most, which are the diffusion and ADC, the susceptibility for blood, the axial T1 and T2. We can do an arterial spin labeling, with, which is a perfusion to the brain and the spectroscopy, depending on the case. Uh, the flare sequence is not sensitive in kids. We don't use contrast usually. And usually we use a feed and wrap protocol. So we just feed the baby and wrap him uh, with the blanket and put him in the MRI. And usually they hold still. Uh, uh, we start to get, we try to get a 3D uh, image to look for the cortex and the cortical mal malformation. But in, so, in some cases, especially if the kid is moving, these are, can be very difficult to, uh, to read. Uh, the MRA and MRV, depending on the, case, on the cases, we don't usually acquire them unless we really want, want them. So I showed you the, the most important image on ultrasound at the, at the level of the midline, and this is the same image, a normal sagittal T1 image at the level of the midline, and we can see the corpus callosum, the brainstem, the cerebellum and the vermis, and the cerebral hemisphere, as well as the pituitary gland. So this image is really important. Uh, for evaluation of uh, the congenital mal malformations in the brain. So when do we image uh, the kid uh, with MRI? So whenever we need to decide what to do in acute setting, so when it will uh, influence the type of management, and it can also be used for the long-term prognostication in the kid to counsel the family. So timing of the study is important, as I told you before. Uh, so Ultrasound can be done around two to 10 days of age. Uh, MRI, we like to do it usually after 24 hours. In the first 24 hours, spectroscopy will be positive. Diffusion won't be really positive, okay? Uh, so in this case, for instance, this is a term neonate, uh, which has a restricted diffusion. So that's the, the diffusion sequence showing restricted diffusion. Uh, and the bilateral frontal lobes, that's the ADC map. So whenever diffusion is increased, ADC is decreased. And this tells us that uh, the findings are uh, real, are real uh, because they are symmetrical, right, in HIE usually. Uh, 
so it's difficult to tell. Restricted diffusion in the basal ganglia, cutamina, uh, thalami, T2 and T1 that are less sensitive, but we shouldn't have uh, this uh, amount of increased signal on T1, some blood in, uh, in the sulci at that level. Um, so I'm going to skip those images. OK, uh, I will show you here some examples since we still have around five minutes. So this is the first case. Uh, it was a baby that had a ger germinal matrix, uh, type 2 germinal uh, matrix uh, hemorrhage. So uh, he had uh, hemorrhage at the level of the left germinal matrix in the left cordothalamic groove. And it had extended the, the, into the ventricles. And that's the follow-up um, uh, ultrasound. Uh, so we have some amount of gliosis here, and if you look at the ventricles, that there are like echogenic material in the ventricles, and the ventricles are increasing in size. So we shouldn't see the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles like that. So the baby is developing hydrocephalus. Uh, so this is his uh, MRI of the brain, and uh, if we look at the third ventricle, the floor of the third ventricle is convex. Uh, inferiorly. So that means that we are starting to have hydrocephalus. Uh, there's also blood in the ventricles. And on the SWI sequence, uh, we have uh, the dark signal in the, in the sulci and the basal cisterns, as well as in the ventricles. And this is hemosiderin deposition from uh, the prior hemorrhage. So this uh, hemosiderin deposition is occluding uh, the subarachnoid ventilation, and it's not allowing them to reabsorb the CSF, and this is why the baby is developing uh, communication hypothesis. <laughs> so case number two. So in this case, just to show you uh, uh, how the CT can actually help. So in this baby, uh, we have a subcutaneous collection, right? And that's the skull the parietal bone, and we have a defect here, which is a fracture of the parietal bone. And here we're suspecting the presence of an extraaxial hematoma. That's the brain parenchyma over here. Uh, so scout view showing the subcutaneous hematoma and the uh, lucency in the bone here. It was confirmed on the, on the 3D reconstruction of the CT. So he had a fracture of the parietal bone, and uh, underlying the fracture, there was an epidural hematoma. Uh, and that's the fracture on uh, on the axial uh, view of uh, of the uh, of the brain. Uh, in this case, like the epidural hematoma was difficult to evaluate, and this was due to the fact that we used we didn't use a superficial probe, and this area here was obscured actually on ultrasound. Uh, another case, just to show you that uh, how uh, ultrasound and MRI uh, can be helpful helpful for the congenital abnormalities. <clears throat> so uh, in this baby, uh, this is the sagittal ultrasound image. And this is the vermis. I told you it looks bright on ultrasound, but it's not complete, right? So we don't see the inferior portion of the vermis. And this is confirmed on the sagittal T2 image on MRI, uh, where we have an elevation of the vermis as well. And this was like a dandy worker malformation. There was also a parencephalic cavity adjacent to the ventricle that you can also see on, we can better see on the, on the MRI. And this was due to a prior bleed in this region as shown by the hemosiderin deposition on the susceptibility image. Uh, okay, uh, just this case, I, I will end with this case showing uh, large extra axial bleed, hematoma with the midline shift. So the baby uh, is starting to herniate underneath the fox cerebri on the coronal image. Uh, so uh, really, uh, to end this presentation, uh, ultrasound of, of the brain is uh, the first modality and the modality of choice to evaluate uh, uh, the brain uh, pathology in neonates. Uh, it can be repeated as much as we want. Uh, it's not very sensitive for HIE, especially in the early 
phase of the disease. Uh, MRI is the modality of choice in these cases, but it should be done after 24 hours. And uh, really, if we can do it before seven days of age, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yazbek. Uh, does anyone have any questions um, for Dr. Yazbek? Uh, Dr. Asbe, I did have one question come in. Just um, if you could just touch on um, the different classifications for IVH um, and kind of what your preferences are, what we use here when we're classifying our, our IVHs. Yeah, as I told you, we, we use uh, a simple like uh, classification that goes from a grade one to the grade four. So this is the classification that we are using here. I don't know if you prefer another one, but uh, this is the simplest classification for the germinal matrix sandwiches uh, that we are using in our reports. So <laughs> the grade one, is this a question? Oh yes, I was gonna actually supplement that question. I've noticed yeah. that many times the description is present, but the classification of grade one, two, three, and four can sometimes be missing and it's a little confusing at times. Like we'll see like that there's a different- Actually, I have spoke, uh, I've spoken with uh, Dr. Carter and Dr. Krishnan that uh, who usually read the uh, ultrasounds and they are saying that we like always put the, the classification on ultrasounds and I'm trying to, to make sure of that whenever I'm reading also. So yeah, we're aware of that uh, you told, uh, as you told us before and I've relayed the message to them as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, also, also Dr. Isaac, could for um, imaging for HIE, could you just touch on um, significance for the timing for post-cooling um, MRI for those babies as to um, the necessary um, necessity of the post-cooling MRI timing of when it needs to be done or, um, or why? So it really depends on the clinical status of the patient, right? Uh, so if we can do it in the time frame of the seven days, that would be great. Like uh, just after cooling stops, but still remain in the time frame of the seven days. Uh, so this is like the most important uh, thing, actually. Um, and with, the, with that timing, is there something that you will be clearly seeing on the MRI in that timing versus if an MRI is done afterwards? Yeah, if the MRI Outside is done moment. afterwards, uh, the diffusion uh, sequence, so the hyper, because Especially in, uh, so let me show you. So for instance, in this baby, right? Uh, okay, so th this is a case of severe HIE, okay? Uh, Okay, so it's a home birth, and uh, the baby required several rounds of CPR, uh, and it was uh, undergoing therapeutic hypothermia, okay, or cooling, and this is the MRI. So in these babies, like all the other images were normal. So the T1, the T2, I only uh, did uh, put the abnormal images, and these are mainly the diffusion sequence that we have on top and the ADC map that's extracted from the diffusion sequence. And the abnormalities are really symmetrical, correct? So if not, you're not used to seeing them, they can be really subtle. Uh, they are bright signal in the thalami, in the insula, in the hippocampal formations, and posteriorly in the medulla, as well as in the dentate nuclei. And it's very subtle on the diffusion, but if you look at the ADC, the ADC helps us confirm that the findings are real, right? So there's dark signal here, low ADC. So if we wait more than seven days, okay, after the insult, ADC will go back to being normal. And the abnormalities on diffusion will be more faint. So we will miss them completely. 
and we will go back to see seeing them again when the baby will develop gliosis and encephalomalacia in these regions. Okay, so this is why the timing is really important. Thank you for that. Um, did anyone else have any questions? I actually had one more. Um, Sandrine, there um, have been scoring systems that I saw used. This is a little bit different from what we were just talking about, but there's the scoring system that I saw used in the Elvis study looking at the outcomes of babies with hydrocephalus or post ventricular dilation with early versus late intervention. Do you mm -hmm. think that those, um, I can't remember the name of the actual scoring system, I'm trying to look it up now, but it was just to kind of evaluate the degree to which like white matter um, injury occurred and whatnot. Are those things like, applicable clinically um, in our setting? I mean, are, do they have greater utility when they're used for studies like that? Or do you see them having any value like for us to have better I guess, standardization in, in, in our language with families when it comes to prognostication? Yeah, so uh, um, so it depends if you, for you, it has a prognostic value, uh, like the studies have a clear prognostic value. If you just give us like uh, what kind of classification you want us to follow, it's easily, it can be easily done either on ultrasound or on MRI actually. Are you talking about the classification on MRI or on ultrasound? It's for MRI. It was a specific okay. tool. I can't, it was not k to go that's for kidney. Um, I'll find it, but yes. yes. Yeah, sure. If you can shoot me an email with it. Uh, yeah, we can definitely do it. Wonderful, thank Just you so much. Just see what that is and yeah, we, we will follow it. Okay. okay. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Yazbek, for that for that talk. Um, with that, we will uh, go right into our next talk. We have Dr. Turan um, discussing maternal factors that affect fetal neurodevelopment. Um, so I will have uh, Dr. Turan. Uh, go ahead and get started. Feel free to just give a quick intro of yourself and. Go ahead and jump in. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Estevez, and one of the first year MFM fellows. I apologize, Dr. Tran was supposed to be here um, alongside me for this lecture, but he just called, got called into the operating room for an emergency. Um, so he might be able to join us by the end, but I'm gonna get started without him. And let me just share my slides here with you. Can everyone see the slides okay? Yep. Okay, great. And it's just the full version of the slide, correct? We can see like the uh, tabs up top, but we can see the full slide. Okay, great. So we will get started. Um, so again, I just wanted to thank everyone for this invitation on behalf of Dr. Tran and I to give this talk to you today titled Maternal Conditions Affecting Fetal Neurodevelopment. I have no disclosures. So there are many maternal conditions known to affect fetal neurodevelopment. Today, we will focus on the six conditions we felt to be the most important. These include diabetes, obesity, thyroid dysfunction, for which I'll focus on hypothyroidism specifically, alcohol use, cannabis use, and cytomegalovirus or CMV infection. Now knowing our major topics of discussion, these are the learning points I hope you will all better understand by the end of today's talk. Number one, in utero exposures can lead to CNS structural abnormalities and childhood neurodevelopmental problems. Two, diabetes and obesity cause similar effects, which are dependent on the severity of maternal disease. Three, 
maternal euthyroidism is important for proper fetal neurodevelopment. Four, cannabis exposure may be as dangerous as alcohol exposure. And five, congenital cytomegalovirus infection remains an important cause of sensory neural hearing loss. Before discussing each condition individually, I do want to briefly review the sequence of normal brain development, as it will help explain why the timing of exposures is so important in determining what effect they may have. As you can see from this diagram, in the first trimester, neurons are developing and multiplying. The neural tube is closed and completed by six weeks of gestation. The second trimester is characterized mostly by neuronal migration and some synapse formation. The third trimester is involved in further strengthening of synapses and synaptic pruning, as well as myelination. Postnatally, the brain continues to develop until about age 18 to 20. For each condition, I will discuss structural and behavioral effects. As one might expect, structural effects are typically seen with early first trimester exposures, whereas functional or behavioral effects typically occur with later exposures. Moving on to our first condition, diabetes. Diabetes during pregnancy can be classified as pregestational or gestational. The incidence of pregestational diabetes is 1% compared to up to 15% incidence of gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is further classified as class A1 if diet controlled versus A2 if medications are necessary. Poorly controlled diabetes leads to many different congenital defects, most commonly affecting the cardiovascular and central nervous systems. CNS malformations associated with poorly controlled diabetes include neural tube defects, holoprosencephaly, which is failure of the brain to properly divide into left and right hemispheres, and hydrocephalus, or accumulation of excess fluid in the ventricles. The illustration on the right depicts the wide variety of neural tube defects that can occur. These differ based on where the neural tube closure defect is. Most cranial in location causes anencephaly, and most caudal in location causes spina bifida. In terms of neurodevelopmental outcomes associated with diabetes, there are many. The most common associations include increased rates of ADHD and autism spectrum disorders, as well as decreased motor skills and decreased cognitive function. This chart on the right was taken from a recent review article published this year that looked at neurodevelopmental outcomes described in children born to mothers with pre-gestational diabetes. In addition to the outcomes I've already described, I wanted to draw your attention to a few details. One, studies showed decreased cognitive abilities and increased general developmental delay are seen more in severe maternal disease. Two, if diabetes is well controlled, children have normal cognition. And three, diabetes in the setting of concomitant obesity leads to further increased risk of both ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. The mechanism of action for these changes is primarily due to maternal hyperglycemia causing fetal hyperglycemia. This in turn leads to increased oxidative stress in fetal tissues and epigenetic changes. It remains evident that if euglycemia is achieved, there is less risk for adverse outcomes, highlighting the importance of strict glucose control during pregnancy.
Next up, we will discuss obesity. Obesity, as everyone is aware, is a growing problem. The latest statistics from 2017 to 2018 reported almost 40% of reproductive aged women were obese with a BMI greater than or equal to 30, and 9% were severely obese with a BMI greater than or equal to 40. I suspect these numbers are even higher today. Like diabetes, obesity has been associated with multiple congenital anomalies. In terms of effects seen on the central nervous system, we also see an increased risk of neural tube defects and hydrocephalus. With respect to neurodevelopmental outcomes, studies have found an association between maternal obesity and cognitive impairment, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, anxiety, depression, and schizophrenia. The table at the top of the slide is from the CHARGE study, which stands for Childhood Autism Risks from Genetics and the Environment, which enrolled children from 2003 to 2010. This table specifically looked at the risk of maternal metabolic diseases on the rates of autism spectrum disorders, or ASD, and developmental delay, abbreviated DD, compared to children of typical development, notated as TD. As you can see, obesity is a statistically significant association with both ASD and developmental delay. There are many hypotheses for why obesity is associated with these effects. The first is that oftentimes obesity and diabetes coexist. Therefore, is there an element of undiagnosed diabetes and hyperglycemia in these patients playing a role? In fact, one of the weaknesses cited in previous papers is that it's hard to control for coexisting diabetes in these patients. Secondly, could it be from nutritional deficiencies, specifically folate, since we know folate is required for proper neural tube development? Although it has been proven that women with obesity have baseline lower levels of folate, studies on folate supplementation in these women does not seem to improve outcomes. Thirdly, could it be a technical issue? ultrasound scanning is inherently more difficult in this population. Therefore, defects may go unnoticed at first and not be identified until later in gestation. In a normal weight pregnancy, however, these defects are identified earlier and might result in terminations rather than continuation of pregnancy. Beyond these current hypotheses, animal models have shown maternal obesity to cause neuroinflammation, increased oxidative stress, and dysregulated insulin, glucose, leptin, serotonergic, and dopaminergic signaling. And just like diabetes, increasing BMI is directly correlated with increased risk of adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. Our next topic is hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is classified as overt hypothyroidism in which TSH is elevated and free T4 is low or subclinical hypothyroidism in which TSH is elevated but free T4 is normal. The incidence of both is 0.5% and two to to 5% respectively in pregnant women. It should be noted that the incidence of overt hypothyroidism may actually be higher, but it typically causes anovulation or first trimester pregnancy loss. Therefore, these patients may never present clinically as pregnant. 
One of the reasons maternal thyroid function is so important is that the fetus relies on maternal thyroid hormone during the critical stage of fetal neurodevelopment. During the first trimester, the only source of fetal thyroid hormone is thyroid hormone from maternal circulation. By 12 weeks gestation, the fetal thyroid gland can begin concentrating iodine and synthesizing thyroid hormone, but does so in very limited amounts. It is not until the mid second trimester, around 18 to 20 weeks, that the fetal thyroid gland produces thyroid hormone in significant amounts. Even once the fetal thyroid gland is more mature, the fetus will continue to receive thyroid hormone from the maternal circulation throughout gestation. Despite the known importance of thyroid hormone to normal brain development, there have not been any associated structural abnormalities described. However, associated neurodevelopmental outcomes include decreased cognition, decreased verbal and perceptual performance, and increased rates of autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. These same effects are not seen, however, in subclinical hypothyroidism, where a maternal T4 is normal. This is why we do not treat subclinical hypothyroidism in pregnancy. There are a variety of mechanisms described for how thyroid hormone is important for proper fetal neurodevelopment. Most of our understanding of the effects seen after thyroid hormone deficiency on CNS development come from animal studies. Some of the major effects seen include abnormal neuronal migration and overall impairment in cortical development. Now we will discuss alcohol use during pregnancy. According to the latest CDC data from 2015 through 2017, the incidence of alcohol consumption during pregnancy was 12% for any type of consumption and 4% for binge drinking. A question many ask is, is there a safe amount of alcohol to drink during pregnancy? The answer is no, as there is no exact dose response relation between the amount of alcohol and the severity of outcomes. It does appear, however, that the pattern of drinking matters. Binge drinking, defined as greater than four drinks at least once a week, is associated with worse outcomes. Overall, heavy exposure to alcohol includes binge drinking or greater than 14 drinks per week, which is an average of two a day throughout pregnancy. It is important to understand why the fetus is so vulnerable to alcohol exposure. Firstly, the fetus is unable to efficiently metabolize alcohol. The rate of fetal alcohol metabolism is only three to 4% the maternal rate. Secondly, each exposure to alcohol is a prolonged exposure. Once alcohol is excreted by the fetus into the amniotic fluid, it gets recycled back into the fetal circulation through fetal swallowing of amniotic fluid. Alcohol is one of the exposures where timing of exposure makes a difference. With first trimester exposures, we typically see facial and structural anomalies. Classic facial features of a child affected by fetal alcohol syndrome include microcephaly, small palpebral fissures, smooth philtrum, and thin upper lip. In the second trimester, the most common effect is pregnancy loss. And in the third trimester, alcohol exposure typically causes abnormal weight, length, and brain growth. Neurobehavioral effects have been documented 
regardless of timing of prenatal alcohol exposure. In addition to facial dysmorphism, alcohol can also cause CNS malformations, including decreased head circumference and hypoplasia of the corpus callosum, cerebellum, basal ganglia, and hippocampus. At the top of the slide, I've included two MRIs of children with documented fetal alcohol syndrome. Panel A is an example of corpus callosum hypogenesis, and B is an example of corpus callosum agenesis. With respect to neurobehavioral outcomes, there are many. Most commonly reported include ADHD, learning and memory problems, lower IQ, and social difficulties. Of those children exposed to heavy prenatal alcohol exposure, 70% will exhibit some of these neurobehavioral effects, even if they do not otherwise meet criteria for fetal alcohol syndrome. There are three main mechanisms of action proposed for the effects of alcohol on fetal neurodevelopment. The first is epigenetics. We know ethanol alters methylation pathways, thereby affecting gene regulation. Secondly, mRNA, microRNAs. We also know ethanol represses certain microRNAs, which then affect cell cycle regulation and cell differentiation. And three, an inflammatory response. Due to upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, there is an increased rate of oligodendrocyte apoptosis, causing myelination impairments. Let's now talk about the current hot topic of marijuana use in pregnancy. Cannabis is one of the most commonly used substances during pregnancy. Depending on the population surveyed, studies suggest an incidence of 2 to 28% amongst pregnant females. 34 to 64% of females who use cannabis prior to pregnancy will continue to use during pregnancy. Historically, we have lagged in our research on marijuana's effects on pregnancy compared to our research on alcohol and tobacco. Due to the lack of data, the public perceived a lack of risk. In fact, 19% of pregnant females believe marijuana poses no risk to their pregnancy. However, this thinking is flawed as lack of studies documenting a risk does not mean that the risk does not exist. Fortunately, more and more studies have now been completed leading to a better understanding of marijuana's effects. We are now tasked with re-educating the public about the documented risks. From a structural standpoint, there have not been any CNS malformations documented. However, there are many associated neurobehavioral outcomes. Some of the most common include autism spectrum disorders, learning disabilities, decreased attention span, and anxiety depression. The illustration on the right tracks the effects of marijuana from the neonatal period through adulthood in both humans and animal models. As you can see, common findings include decreased birth weight, decreased dopamine receptors, increased hyperactivity, increased anxiety and depression, and decreased memory function. So what is the mechanism behind these effects? We know cannabinoids exert their function via cannabinoid receptor type one. Human fetuses have been shown to express this receptor 
as early as 14 weeks and increase the density of these receptors throughout gestation, suggesting a key role in normal brain development. Animal models additionally have found cannabinoids to affect neurotransmitter systems, as well as neuronal proliferation, migration, differentiation, and survival. I will say it is somewhat difficult to be certain about the specific effects of marijuana on pregnancy and the developing fetus, in part because those who use it often use other drugs as well. Additionally, adverse socioeconomic conditions such as poverty and malnutrition may contribute to outcomes otherwise attributed to marijuana. And last but not least, cytomegalovirus. Cytomegalovirus is the most common congenital viral infection. It can be classified as either a primary infection or a non-primary or recurrent infection. In the pregnant population, the incidence of primary infection is 0.7 to 4% and 13.5% for non-primary infection. The rates of vertical transmission between the two types of infections vary considerably at 30 to 40% transmission rate for primary versus only 0.15 to 2% for non-primary. An important guiding principle is that while the risk of vertical transmission is highest in the third trimester, infection in the first trimester leads to the most serious sequelae. This figure is taken from a recent review article published in 2020 that examined the natural history of neonates infected with CMV following a maternal primary infection. As you can see, 12.7% were considered symptomatic. This symptomatic group included neonates with the following characteristics, small for gestational age, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, petechiae, pneumonia, retinitis, neurological symptoms, and or severe abnormalities on head imaging. Of this group, three to 4% died, while 96 to 97% survived. Amongst the survivors, however, 40 to 58% suffered from at least one long-term sequela. In the asymptomatic group, 13.5% experienced sensory neural hearing loss, while the remaining 86.5% experienced no sequelae. It should be noted that for non-primary infections, our data is limited to case reports. Therefore, the frequency of neonatal outcomes is not as well established. There are many associated CNS malformations in congenital CMV infection. The most commonly seen include periventricular calcifications, ventriculomegaly, microcephaly, and cerebellar hypoplasia. In terms of associated neurodevelopmental outcomes, the most common finding is sensory neural hearing loss. But other findings such as global developmental delay, abnormal tone, and seizures have also been described. Many studies have looked at the mechanism of action behind CMV effects. With respect to hearing loss, the current theories include either an immune response versus viral destruction of the cells in the inner ear. To help explain the etiology of brain lesions, in vitro studies have investigated which cells are predominantly affected and have found them to be neural stem cells. Destruction of neural stem cells 
then leads to loss of brain mass and abnormal neuronal migration. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate the main learning points from today's talk. Number one, in utero exposures can lead to CNS structural abnormalities and childhood neurodevelopmental problems. Two, diabetes and obesity cause similar effects, which are dependent on the severity of maternal disease. Three, Maternal euthyroidism is important for proper fetal neurodevelopment. Four, cannabis exposure may be as dangerous as alcohol exposure. And five, congenital cytomegalovirus remains an important cause of sensory neural hearing loss. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Estevez, for that um, talk. Uh, we'll open it up to anyone if anyone has any questions. Dr. Estevez, I was wondering um, with the new um, data out with the cannabis exposure, is there any change in the way that you're also um, counseling parents postnatally um, at follow-up visits on um, continued use of um, cannabinoids in any, um, especially those that are breastfeeding? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think throughout my training, our counseling on marijuana use during pregnancy and during breastfeeding has really changed quite drastically. Originally, we were telling people we don't recommend it, um, but we don't really have um, specific data about what it causes. We just don't know enough to say it's okay to use in pregnancy. And now we have a lot of data that shows it causes lots of effects for the neonate during the pregnancy, but also it is transferred in breast milk. So we do talk to patients um, that are asking about marijuana use and is it safe to breastfeed, we do have to say we wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but at the same time, there are lots of benefits to breastfeeding. So for individual cases, you kind of have to weigh the risk benefits of would this mom and baby do better with breastfeeding, taking the risk of marijuana exposure uh, versus not having breastfeeding. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, is there, um, so this type of information you obtain for intake, like voluntary intake, or are the talk screen done uh, at prenatal, like early prenatal visits right now? Mm -hmm. It sort of depends on what institution you're at. Um, a lot of people are sending urine talk screens at the initial prenatal visit. And if anyone does admit to substance use, we do typically screen them um, each trimester with a urine tox screen. And that does make it difficult because any substance use during pregnancy, we're mandated to report to DCF. So a lot of times patients don't want to admit that they are using any substances for the fear that that'll file a DCF case report. Um, in my experience, if a mom is only using marijuana, not cocaine or heroin or anything like that, just marijuana, I have heard of zero cases where that affects their um, custody status of the child. Yes, a case has to be opened, but nothing usually comes of it because DCF is is far busier dealing with other things than marijuana. But so the, the uh, talk stream are only done if they voluntarily say they are consuming some drugs. It's not mandatory? In some centers, some places I will think. send routine urine drug screens at every initial prenatal visit. And if it's positive, then you'll test them each trimester. And if it's negative, that's it. You tested them once during the pregnancy and you you don't test them again. Okay. 
Are there any other questions for Dr. Estevez? Okay, again, thank you um, for stepping in for Dr. Turan. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Um, so at that point, at this point, um, we will break for lunch in pediatric grand rounds, and then we will start back up um, uh, at one o'clock p.m. on the same link. So we will see everyone back here in an hour. Thank you. Thank you.